and welcome to another installment of the Remote Funk Filter Podcast. Hello, guys. To Hello. My Hello. 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 Wave at me, you can't. <laughs> I, I am waving. George just sat there saying, I'm waving, doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> don't sell me out, Eddie. <laughs> no. The audience don't know that. Oh, they do now. Right. How are you two handling um, isolation? Well, who are we, Sam? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm joined at a distance by, with, boy, I'm joined by Eddie. <laughs> Hello. And Jordan. Hello. How are you finding isolation, guys? And you are Sam, as I've already pointed <laughs> out. How are you finding isolation, guys? <laughs> do, do you know what? I've started jogging. Oh, okay. Why? Um, so I, My sister's <laughs> other half works for a charity and he's setting up like a fundraising 10 mile run thing called a virtual 10 mile or something. So this sounds horrible. Yeah, well, I agreed to do it. So, okay. <laughs> Um, I've actually got to start practicing now. How does he vet that you um, run the distance? Um, it's so all it's all being linked together through an app. So okay. you can then, the, the data will get recorded on the app and then get sent to them. So they How does the see. app record the data? I don't know. I well, mean, it's, steps, it's, isn't it? Yeah, the, really? yeah, I don't know. Running apps are weird. I don't quite understand. Yeah, them. but literally, how does it? Because like with the Wii remotes, what well, if you if you just like sat on the sofa and just sort of shook it up and down, it yeah. would like register that as you running. So you could run like the marathon on like Wii Sports, and you'd just be sitting on your sofa just doing like a masturbatory like shake. Yeah. Um. It, well, that's. It will say, it I mean, have, I doubt it's foolproof, is it? Well, it has it's a GPS map. Ah, oh, so right. Okay. It can see. Ride a bike. Get on, a, get on a buggy. I don't know. Um, and it also tells. I mean, I don't. I don't think you should cheat it. No, I was saying. It <laughs> I don't think you should cheat it. There is options for walk, run, bike. No, no. I'm, and ju- I'm just, I'm just, I'm just sort so. of poking at the boundaries of this thing. I'm yeah. trying to find out if it's right. how like foolproof it is. Uh, I don't know. Well, I, I sp- I've not tried to cheat it yet. <laughs> yet. Oh, well, okay. I suppose it depends on uh, the idea that the people using it. Why would they be cheating it? <laughs> like, why? Why would? It's not like I'm in my house. Kind of just moving back and forth, so I get my ten thousand steps a day. Yeah, and go ha! I've beaten my phone. <laughs> I don't actually no, no, get the, the whole benefit point of, cheating of the you don't point even have of to it. walk. You could just sit there and you can cheat your ten thousand steps. But why? But why would you cheat it? Consider you don't gain any. It's not like oh, if you if you walk ten thousand steps, you get money. You, you the benefit is the exercise itself. Yeah, and so it's like ha! I beat the phone. So you gain nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you just gain nothing at all. Oh, I've had a, a fairly healthy diet for the last four days. Yeah, well, so. I've had, um, as has been reported, sciatica. So uh, I've been walking to the fridge less. <laughs> <laughs> so it's helped in that sense. Yeah. But as we point we pointed out, uh, the world has gone on lockdown. And considering that my life was basically one of a hermit anyway, I've been restricted to not moving at all. So it's kind of this this Russian doll of shit. Yeah, <laughs> I've just imprisoned. I, I mean, to be fair, I, I would say like I, so. I um, I've ordered a PlayStation Four. Okay, right, but it did say the estimate uh, estimated arrival date is um, between the end of April and the start of May. Oh yeah, right. you're gonna be waiting a while. Yeah, it's not so, essential. Yeah, definitely. I'm gonna f- try and finish everything I've got, I've got on my Xbox 360 first. So that by the time it arrives, I've completed all of them, and I can be like, ah, something new to play. What are you? What mm-hmm. are you getting for your PS4? You getting Doom Eternal? No, not yet. You should get uh, Doom Eternal. The Last of Us, Uncharted, Fallout Four, and then I've ordered the new Modern Warfare as well. Uh, I could have, I could have uh, fobbed off, fobbed you off with my copy of Fallout Four, which I haven't touched since I played it for the first time. Well. My problem with it is sort of the just the sheer like open endedness of it. No, nah, because I, there's, there's I like, do like that. Like even with Fallout Three, the the missions where you could just chill in Megaton for fucking forever and do basically fuck all. No, I as I get older, I just I just um steer more and more towards games where it's like okay, here's the objective, go. Mm. I can't be doing with like um open world sandboxes and stuff like that where it's like here's a story mission but also you can just kind of like fuck about for 20 minutes or yeah. fuck about for two hours or whatever like that stuff's fine and i don't like uber linear games i like mm. games where it's sort of like says the sonic the hedgehog uh, obsessed. <laughs> yeah no i know <laughs> i know um no I, I think like the good the for me the best games at the moment are the games that sort of like they it's there's a clear like goal but you have like a certain amount of freedom within that so for example like the, the old spyro games mm. like spyro one like you go into the world you collect the eggs you move on to the next world but you can sort of tackle them in any order and you can sort of move around and you're not like it's not like sonic where you're sort of constricted and sort of like you have to run down this narrow corridor and all that kind of stuff 
Doom Eternal's a bit like that as well. I want to talk about it briefly because okay. that's sort of an, an instance of it's just like a straightforward first person shooter. It's like here's the level, here are the enemies, just go hog wild. But there's like, you have all these different weapons that sort of have different effects on different enemies. So it's like, even though the, the sort of the catharsis of it is typical of like a mindless shooter game, there's actually a lot of like strategy that goes into it. Yeah. Because you have each weapon that's sort of like, they sort of expose weak points on different enemies. And then you have equipment that like, oh, if you use like the flamethrower, you'll get armor from the enemies. And then if you do like this specific type of kill animation, you'll get health. And if you use a chainsaw, you'll get ammo. So it's all about like, resource management and using the right weapons at the right times and sort of knowing you know that kind of stuff yeah which is really really good but this i'll broaden it out a little bit because i feel like we're just sort of i'm just talking at the moment so i want to put a question to you yeah, both. the main protagonist of doom is doom guy and he's basically just this silent protagonist he's like the whole gimmick of doom guy is that he's this very angry man who just wants to kill demons mm. to the point where in doom 2016 they have like a cutscene where someone within the facility basically basically in the first one it's set on this facility on mars in which they've been mining energy from hell Mm -hmm. as like a renewable energy source and all of the demons escape from hell and basically destroy the base then you wake up and your mission is go kill all the demons so the guy sort of comes over the loudspeaker and he's like oh hey i'm a guy um let me tell you the history of this place and let me tell you exactly what's happened and you just take the monitor and you just throw it across the room and then you just go and kill demons for the rest of the game. So it's like a statement of, like, we can't be fucking bothered with all this, like, story, and you want to kill demons, he wants to kill demons, Just let's just go do it, you know? Mm. But in Doom Eternal, they seem to have... Doom Eternal feels more like a like a like like an old-fashioned arcade video game. Yeah. Like, they have floating pickups and extra lives, and, like, they have very specific, like... Like I said, like, if you use the chainsaw, you get ammo and all of this stuff, which is very, like video gamey it doesn't make sense in the reality of that world yeah but at the same time they seem to have gone in a far more story heavy direction like they mean they need they've sort of made a concerted effort to sort of explain the history of the doom of doom guy the doom slayer and where he's come from and how he is who he is and stuff like that yeah and there's a moment in the game where it kind of flashes back and you hear him speak Right. So the que- the question I, I sort of want to start with for both of you is, can you think of any instance in any piece of media where a silent protagonist or a silent character will suddenly speak and it works? Because as soon as Doomguy started speaking, my immediate thought was like, oh, what, you, what have you done that for? Like, this, why is this guy, why is he speaking now, but he's not speaking during the game? And, and like, I, st- I always think of stuff like that when I hear characters speak for the first time. I don't think the answer to the question doesn't have the same implication that it does across all different forms of media. Okay. Um, it's one thing for a video game character to suddenly start talking. A completely different thing if it's a, you know, a character in a TV show that typically has been mute and all of a sudden starts talking. Yeah. Two very different things. Yes. Because obviously a big appeal of video games and if it hasn't been said before, I am not a video game guy. Yes. <laughs> but Your silence during that whole conversation or that whole monologue, yes. yeah. I think, was testing. Yeah, that, that spoke volume. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the appeals, you know, it, it's you, essentially, isn't mm-hmm. it? Well, that's sort of why I kind of disliked what they've done in Doom Eternal, because they've probably yeah, yeah, yeah. characterized so, him. Like, in the first, in Doom 2016, he had agency outside of the player. You know, the fact mm-hmm. that he, like, throws the screen away and the, the fact that he sort of deliberately disobeys orders and stuff. Like, he's always had an agency beyond the player. Mm-hmm. But because you never see his face and you never heard him and his history was never explained, you sort of felt like an extension of him. Mm. Yeah. Whereas in Doom Eternal, he's like a completely separate entity that you occasionally get to control. That's what it sort of feels like now. Mm. It feels like, ironically, the, the connection has sort of loosened to that character a little bit because they've made a concerted effort to go okay, this is specifically what he looks like, what he sounds like, who he is. I don't know, because I, I don't know if there's a, um, if that's even a rule that universally applies in video games. Because I was, I was thinking, with games like this, which are, you know, intensely violent shooters, yeah. it might work, because, yeah, there's the, you know, story is not the principal dimension, it's the experience, the action, the violence. Yes, yeah. And so... If it is just kind of a a cardboard cutout that you're inhabiting, mm. uh, then that works. But then you've got things like Gears of War, which uh, is very successful, and that's kind of just a that's just a violent demon shooter, right? Uh, yeah, in essence, yeah, yeah. But that that's a character as well, isn't it, Marcus Phoenix? Yes, and that's a very well loved character, as far as I understand. Yeah, but that's I mean the the Gears games have always been third person, like it's always yeah, yeah, yeah. you've always seen that character. You're always aware yes. that you're sort of like 
sharing the space with another character. With yeah, character, so obviously that's to try and complement the player experience. But for instance, I don't know, like in film, I mean, it can be used to great effect, can't it? Mm. With great power. The idea of a character that doesn't speak suddenly speaking. Yeah. It's kind of a plot point, but the salient example for me is Caesar, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, you know, like that's... Okay. Well, I mean, that's different because he... Like, there are instances where it sort of makes sense for the character to suddenly... Like, Caesar is a perfect example because he's just gained the ability to speak. And yes. the execution of that scene is... Pretty, like, I think for me personally, the Rise of the Planet of the Apes is the weakest of the three. I agree. But that moment where he kind of goes, no, like he screams at... Um, not Tom Holland. What's Tom he called? Felton. Tom Felton. Uh, that's like one of the best moments of that trilogy, hands down. It's a great yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it makes sense that he like has only just started speaking. The same, kind of the same with uh, the general in Prison Break. Right. Like throughout series okay. two, he never speaks. He's always like holding up little pieces of paper, asking questions, and saying what he wants to say. And then at the very end of series two, they sort of go out on a boat in the middle of the lake, and he suddenly starts speaking. And you kind of you infer from that, oh, the reason he never did it was so that if people are listening to the conversation, yeah. they're only going to hear one side of it, so they're not going to know what's being discussed. Yes. The problem with Prison Break is as soon as he starts speaking, he never shuts up. Well, that's the thing. That it, it's you know, its execution is terrible because you know the thinking behind that is let's introduce a villain character that has an air of mystery about him. Yeah. Like, ooh, that how very interesting and enigmatic he writes his responses on little bits of paper. Yeah. But then, yeah, as soon as they realize, as soon as they made him the primary villain of uh, the final season in particular. Yeah. It's like, all right, okay, we've written ourselves into a corner here. He has to speak. Yes. So yeah, fu- fuck it. He, that rule has just gone out the window now. That, that doesn't yeah, matter anymore. Yeah, he just anymore. talks, yeah. Yeah. I don't, like I said, I don't know if the, uh, there's a, a kind of yes or no answer to that question in a way. There are characters who rarely speak. So when they do, uh, you know, the economy of the language mean like Gus Fring springs mm, to mind. Yeah, like he's he's hardly he's hardly mute, but whenever he does speak, you know, you know, you listen. Mm, yes, but yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, in, in the case of Doom, it it does sound like it's to its detriment. Yeah, I do feel like there's a temptation in in the instance of Doom, and there are, and there are other instances as well where it just kind of feels like the creators are sort of giving into temptation. Where it's like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if our silent protagonist suddenly talked? Or wouldn't it be cool if our masked protagonist would suddenly take off his mask? Yeah. Especially since uh, the the, the last thing I'll say about Doom is the only time he speaks is in flashbacks. And in those flashbacks, he doesn't say or do anything that couldn't have been expressed silently. I think that's the thing that sort of annoyed me the most about it. Yeah. is Is that it was ultimately irrelevant. Well, yeah. What do the flashbacks add? Well, it's sort of... you. In the level they happen, you've returned to... um, I think it's like the capital city of the people that sort of adopted the Doomslayer and I assume trained him up to... Right. I think all of this stuff is explained Mm. in like flavor text but I just can't be bothered with all that shit. Okay. Um, Reading. Yeah, he's... As you're going through the level it's flashing back and it's basically showing that they brought him to... They threw him into this gladiatorial arena. They basically saw like like how well he fought and sort of... How how well he slayed Doom. How well he slayed Doom, yes. And they were like, okay, we'll use this guy. We like him. We can use him. Mm-hmm. But all the Doom Slayer basically says is, oh, big guts. I'm going to kill them all. I'm going to kill all the demons. That's literally all he right. says. It's almost verbatim. It's not quite okay. verbatim. But it's almost verbatim. It's like, well, you've done a fantastic job of displaying that intensity in the past two games. Why the hell did you need to break his silence for that? You know? Yeah. And it's sort of like with... Um, Neither of you finished The Mandalorian, did you? Series 1 of The Mandalorian. No. The final episode of The Mandalorian, because the whole point of The Mandalorian is he can never take off his helmet. If he takes off his helmet and another person sees him without his helmet on, that automatically kicks him out of the Mandalorian tribe or religion or whatever the hell they are. Okay. Right. In the final episode, he takes off his helmet. Yeah. And it just kind of felt like, well, why'd you do that? The hell did you do that for? Maybe he wanted to have a shower and he didn't want to get his your helmet wet. <laughs> You can't have you can't have a shower without getting your helmet wet. <laughs> Fair play. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I mean they, they they did it, didn't they? Because it's the it's the finale, and you've got to have like a tidbit more about him. I, I guess know. was like, the thinking. The context of it is he's in like this battle, and he gets wounded, mm. um, and there's like a he's bleeding from like the back of his head. So there's a robot that's there, and the robot's like, "I'm gonna like fix your head." <laughs> and he's like, but I can't take off my helmet. No no living person can ever see me without my helmet. And the robot's like, well, I'm not alive. All right. So the Mandalorian's like, yeah, all right. So he takes off his helmet. We see the guy. And the robot basically fixes this, like, fatal wound. Yeah. And the Mandalorian is fine again. Okay. I, I um, got to say, I call bullshit on that just because saying the, the, the droid saying, well, I'm not alive, therefore it doesn't count. Yeah. 
I mean, in the Star Wars universe, they're basically sentient, aren't they? They're essentially just r- metallic humans. Like, C-3PO is just a camp dude that happens to be a <laughs> robot. Mm, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I call bullshit, like, so, oh, no, but there has to, you have to be organic matter and have blood pumping yeah. through your veins. Oh, that's stupid. I don't know. I don't it's know if the idea is no that it's, it's, it's just, like, complicated AI, but they are still technically not alive. No, yeah, sure. But no, isn't that the point? Is it wasn't that one of like the 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 um the flavors of Star Wars was that the droids were like um a slavery facsimile? They're like an underclass that are looking for are they rights. in Star Wars? I are think they look, so. Are they looking They've for got, rights? Well, you've got that stupid robot from Solo, the the the, the feminist uh, robot. Uh, I've seen it. That's like oh, droid rights. There's a feminist <laughs> robot in Solo. Have you either of you seen Solo? N- no, it looks okay. Like well, a I don't shit. recommend it. But yeah, one of the main characters in that film is like a, a feminist robot. <laughs> There's a moment is where she um, blue. Is it like her head blue? No, 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 no. She's like a not. blue robot. Um, she's oh, okay. one of right. she's Lando's best friend though. So whenever Lando's in the film, she's basically there. Right. But there's a moment where someone's on the Millennium Falcon and they go to they go they're like leaving the uh, the cockpit for something. And they ask the droid. They're like, "What do you want?" And she immediately, without hesitation, just goes, "Equal rights." <laughs> Shut the okay. fuck up. Well, was that a robot statement or was that a feminist statement? What do you mean? Oh, does the robot want... Oh. oh, was that like, she, oh we, we, want, we want equal rights because... Right, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, probably both. Well, you can't have both. Don't be fucking greedy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of these days, Eddie, you're going to say something just off the cuff that's going to get you in some serious <laughs> trouble. I don't care. and we're Because we're not going to call you out on it, either because we're just not going to notice it. Or because you'll, you'll agree. Or because, or because we'll we agree, agree with it. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll get out car, we'll just be like, oh, we didn't hear him. Oh, yeah. Ooh, bad Eddie. Bad Eddie. Oh, no. I mean, if you're looking oh. for a. This is not the podcast to find reasonable no. mediators. No. <laughs> I do just say. It is about just saying kind of what the fuck you want within reason. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I suppose on the podcast, I try to limit it to relatively palatable language. <laughs> <laughs> but still. Um, oh, the Mandalorian takes his. Yeah, uh, and it's kind off. of. Um, I'm not. I'm not saying it doesn't. It didn't feel like the actor went. I want you to see me without my helmet on because I'm a famous actor and I want people to see my face. It didn't feel like yeah. that. I trust that. I don't know no. much about Diego Luna, whatever he's called, but I trust that he would. Uh, Pedro Pascal. Pedro Pascal. Who's Diego Luna? Uh, well, you're being that's being very racist there. Oh. Rogue One. He's the male lead. <laughs> oh in Rogue yeah. One. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I realise how bad that seems now. <laughs> it's fine. I'm a misogynist, George. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, they're both in um, Narcos, the TV. No, I mean, not the. Okay. You wouldn't know that, so I'm just giving right. you an excuse here. So does that mean that but, Narcos uh, was racist first? No, Narcos is about Mexicans and the right, cartel. Okay. So. Just happens to have two Mexican actors, I, even though I don't. I don't think Pedro Pascal's Mexican. Oh, oh, what's it matter? Oh, it's all. Look. Where, it's all. Pedro uh, Pascal from? It's all. Help me finish that sentence. It's all racist, Mexican-y. human. It's all Mexican. Um, he's he's from Chile. He's Chilean. Uh, okay, all right. So Pedro Pascal is Chilean. I think Diego Luna is Mexican, isn't right, he? Right, okay. Uh, Diego Luna is Mexican. Yeah, okay. He is Mexican, okay. Yeah, no, I trust I trust him. I trust it's not a case of, I want you to see me without my helmet. But it did feel like, um, just show some restraint, you know? We didn't... Well, I suppose the argument would be that they've been showing restraint for the entire season. Yeah, but why did you they've stop got, there? They've got a second season. Yeah, but that's the, that's the thing now. Well, like, presumably, if, aren't they? If, if the second season, like, he does end up removing his helmet again... It's not going to have the same impact. It's like, but well, we've seen you without your helmet now. But th- presumably they are building up or kind of b- breaking down the layers in terms of the more the show goes on, the more visible he's going to be. Mm, yeah. I mean, presumably if this goes on for years, which it could feasibly, it's going to get to a point where it's half and half or even yeah. mostly not, Okay. you know? Yeah, I doubt this is going to be a case of, oh, you get this one kind of uh, glimpse and then we're back to business as usual. Yeah. The, 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 yeah, they kind of... They're desensitizing you. Well, they're sensitizing yes, you. Yes, but him. I don't know. Just like the moment his helmet came off, and it was just like I always knew there was a guy underneath there, and I always knew who was playing him. Mm. But just the moment his helmet came off, all the kind of like the the sort of mystery. Yeah, the mystery and like the coolness of that character just went, boop, just went, it just disappeared. It's like oh, you're just a guy, mm. right? You know, that's always the case, though, isn't it? I mean, the monster is is never as terrifying. Uh, seen as half seen, you know. No, but I feel like not saying that Mexicans are monsters, by the way, <laughs> or Ch- not saying that Chileans no, are no, monsters. That's, that's exactly you sure, what Sam? Saying, you sure that's it? not what you're saying? Well, the Chileans are monsters. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to try and make some sort of joke, but I I know literally nothing about Chile, <laughs> other than it sounds like a food. It does. 
and a, st- a state of warmth. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's the extent of my knowledge. Oh, dear. Oh. Was there anything else before we dive into the big one? Uh, you said you had a couple of things you wanted to... Yeah, that to, was the uh, first one I sort of wanted to ask about. Us. Are yeah. either of you familiar with Hunted or The Heist? No. Uh, no. Okay. They're both very... Si- I'm going to sort of explain them around about the same time. Um, so basically, the premise of these shows is that they're sort of reality TV slash game shows. Okay. Uh, in the case of Hunted, like 10 people basically go on the run from this sort of nebulous law enforcement. And the idea is that they have to evade capture for three weeks. And if they manage to do that, then they get like prize money at the end of it. But they have to go to like, uh, towards the end of their time, they, they're sort of told, oh, you have to go to this extraction point at this specific time. And they have to evade the capture of the hunters, as they call them. Right. Um, and if they get extracted successfully, then they get like prize money. Mm. The heist, it's basically the same premise. Although instead of just being on the run from the law, they have to rob a bank and then they have to, again, avoid being captured and avoid being charged for robbery. And if they manage to launder their money at the end of the three weeks, then they get to keep all the money that they've stolen from the bank. Right. Now, this was first introduced to me by my parents. My dad was sort of explaining it to me. He was like, oh, it's about these people who rob a bank and blah, blah. So I was like, oh, so like, um, it's a, like a scripted show then. Like, no, no, it's real. Mm. What do you mean it's real? Well, no, it's, it's a reality. It's real people. You can sign up for it. It's like the X Factor or something. You sign up for it. The producers will like vet you and then they stick you in the back of a van and you go on the run for three weeks. Right. Like, oh, okay. Is there like restrictions? They're like, no, no, you can go anywhere in the UK. Right. So yeah, I just want you, I just want you and the audience as well, if you want, I want you to imagine for a moment that you're the person who's pitching either of these shows to their respective TV networks. Mm. And I want you to just try and imagine where the hell you start when it comes to explaining the fucking logistics of this thing. Right. Okay. Well, I'd have to understand them first. So let me clear everything with you and then I'll try and formulate a pitch in my head. Okay. So I'm a member of the public. I'm just an ordinary person. Yes. And I sign up to be on this game show. Yes. On this game show, I'm on the run. Yes. That's the premise. And I'm being hunted by your Richard Osmonds, for lack of a better term. So like, you know, people of the show, um, right? No, they're real, like, law enforcement. That's a waste of fucking law enforcement. What do you mean they're real law enforcement? Well, the guy the guy who sort of spearheads the team in Hunted is uh, like an ex-sniper who went to work for the police. No, force. no, okay, that's fair enough, yeah. But but they're working for the show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. They've been selected by... They're real law enforcement using real law enforcement techniques. But yeah, they're not like... They didn't just go down to like Ponty Police Station and be like, oh, can you find these people for yeah, us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And presumably they recur episode to episode. Yes. It's the same hunters. Yeah. How much information do the hunters have? It seems to... Okay, so in the in terms of hunted, they seem to know from the very beginning who they're hunting and where the the uh, people that they're hunting start from. Okay. In the case of the heist, they have no idea who they're hunting. Right. This will lead to sort of what I wanted to sort of talk about. Okay. But like, in the heist, they sort of pretend that they're learning about the bank robbery for the first time. Okay. So they'll just sort of be in an office and they're like... Governor, have you heard? The Bank of Northumberland is being robbed and all that shit. <laughs> Governor. Okay, so in Hunted, yeah. Yeah, presu- you get some sort of head start, presumably. No. No, no, they know. The hunters know where you are from the beginning. How do. I don't understand. I don't. <laughs> not genuinely. I, that's what, if I they know I, where you are, we'll just go to the place then and arrest them. I don't get yeah, what the. It was literally. Because I've only seen, in fairness, I've only seen the latest season of both shows right and it's been going for a couple of seasons now so it might have been different in the beginning but in the terms of hunted they just literally had a helicopter following the van being like okay these guys are going to start going on the run in a minute right but after that because they all managed to evade capture when they spilled out of the van so from that point on they don't know where you are. okay and they they don't know where you're supposed to go well you're not other than the extraction point which they typically don't find out about until like the last couple of days you basically have right, 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 completely right, okay. free reign. You can go anywhere and do anything so long as you stay within the UK. Okay, and, and they don't know, the hunters don't know the extraction point. No, they're they never given, given that, that information. information. Although when when the, the okay. hunters are given, are given that information, the hunters are alerted to where the message was given to them. So what resources are at the hunter's disposal? Most, well, any resource that law enforcement would typically use to find the person. So they can track your phone, they can use CCTV, they can use right. drones, they can use helicopters. They can access CCTV? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Do you see where this is starting to Well, like- I feel like, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of moving parts there. Yeah. It's an easy thing to pitch. It's like, right, okay, 
we manufacture a situation where you've got people on the run and people trying to catch them using traditional law Oh yeah, it's a wickedly techniques. simple premise. It's just the moment where you have to go, right, so do the camera people... I'm assuming that for this to, uh, you know, to have absolutely any mileage to it, that they have to falsify oh, yeah. or engineer much of it in the sense of all you got to do is look out for a camera. Exactly, crew. yeah. Mm. <laughs> it's obviously got it all completely artificial. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be. In fairness, there's a message at the beginning of both programs basically saying that like in terms of CCTV and phone tracking, that stuff has been replicated for the purpose of the show. What, replicated CCTV? Yeah. Meaning what? Well, they obviously, presumably they had access to the real CCTV. Right. And the CCTV that we're seeing is footage that the show has recorded. Right. So you're, yeah, not, so actually you're not actually seeing, seeing cameras, you're just seeing yeah, like, okay. a, like a, um, what's what they call reconstruction. But, but, yeah, but then they have to reconstruct that footage. Yes. So they have to bring in the the, 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 hum- yes. the normal human and get them to reenact. Yes, exactly. Okay, this all, this all just There's smell, also, smells like um, bullshit I think it was me, a rule that was only introduced in the most recent series of Hunted, the people who are on the run right. have no resources at the disposal. They have no money. They have no equipment. Yeah. They basically they basically have to just go around yeah. asking members of the public, oh, can you drive me to this place? Can I stay in your house? Can I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do, they, do the hunties and the camera crews just go into the houses of random members of the public mm. without doing like health and safety checks and vetting that person? Well, that's the thing. Like it's, it's, it's an intriguing premise on its surface, you know, especially considering that, you know, that they can travel anywhere. They can do anything. That's yeah. an attractive... But yeah, when you actually know anything about how television is made, you just, yeah, Yeah, you exactly. There's, like, moments where they've, like, gone up to, like, Jennifer, public member or whatever, and being like, oh, can I stay in your house? And she's like, yeah, all right. And then, like... <laughs> where is this Jennifer? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, she, they go into their house, and then she goes, like, oh, I'm going out to the shops for a minute. I'll see you later. Like, if some, like, camera crew or not, if some person, like, ran up to you and was like, hey, I'm on the run for the police, can I stay in your house? Yeah. Firstly, you wouldn't say yes. I don't know about you guys, I wouldn't say yes. No. It depends what they're on the run for. Well, yeah, but, like, you wouldn't just be like, okay, I'm going to the shops now, don't, like, steal my steal shit. anything from my house. <laughs> yeah. Do they, um, do they do talking heads? Yes. The people with whom they interact, with with whom they With encounter? all of them. With the hunters as well. Okay. The talking heads, though, look like they are filmed after the yeah. events of the show. Okay. Whereas with the hunters, it looks like they're being filmed as the show is happening. Right. Well, without having seen it, it just sounds like bullshit. <laughs> like I, 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 I will add, I have uh, while we've been doing this, I've looked up Hunted, and it turns out there is also a celebrity version of it. Oh, yeah. The, the most recent series had, like, Boris Johnson's dad on it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> It was like Gavin Gavin okay. Ensign. Uh, it was like a rugby player yeah. or something. Gavin Ensign. Gavin Ensign. He's Welsh. Gavin yeah. Ensign. Three of them are from um, shows like Made in Chelsea and The Only Way is Essex. Yeah, yeah. They're celebrities though, Eddie. That's the, that's the that's, tragic that's thing. That's not, no, they're not, they're not celebrities. They're reality <laughs> TV stars. What do you think? I am not saying that anybody who watches this is stupid. Okay. I really am not saying that. However, this is clearly television made for stupid people, isn't it? But, you know, again, I want to qualify that. By which I mean, if you sacrifice all cognitive interaction with this show, don't think about it at all from a production level or from any level, really. Yeah. Maybe it's entertaining. But I, I don't know how you could derive any enjoyment when you know I all think, of it. I don't is think it's just that it's made for stupid people. I think the idea, because I, I, I watched it with my family, and I think that is sort of an ideal yeah. context in which to watch it. It's you put it on with a group of people. And you kind of watch it going, well, that's bullshit. That's bullshit. Okay. Or even even if you're not going, that's bullshit. Like, even if you're just like, you know, oh, why the fuck did he do that for? Why is he not, like, doing this? Yeah. you just sort of like, you're commenting on the show in real time. Sounds like you kind of yeah, invested, yeah. Joel. No, and again, I'm not I'm not saying that uh, only stupid people watch it. I am genuinely saying that it's made for a viewer that isn't really thinking about what they're watching, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It's made for someone who, can, who could genuinely buy into it presentation yes it's the kind of thing my father would watch but it's also the kind of thing that he would say oh it's terrible but you know i watch it <laughs> well that's the problem and that's what, what what i sort of wanted to put to you both is it's it feels like it's kind of the worst of both worlds for both shows now mm. because obviously you can't buy into the reality that they're depicting because it just doesn't make sense mm. the fact that they've got cct the fact that you never see the camera people yeah the fact that the show is never filmed at night when surely that's like the perfect opportunity to find someone who's on the run it's when they're asleep and not yeah. fucking moving. Well, under cover of darkness. Yeah, exactly. Well. And the, 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 the sort of the moments where drama is clearly being contrived. Like in the final episode of, I think it was Hunted, 
Yeah, it was hunted. There's two groups of people left. There's a couple and two best friends, right? Mm. In the final episodes, the people who are doing the talking heads start asking the couple about like, oh, so when do you think you're going to like get married? When do you think you're going to like settle down? And the woman's like really into the idea and the guy is very like, he's like dodging the questions. Right. And the best friends, like up until this point, they've been in like, there's been a little bit of tension in the sense that like a couple of times they've done something, the other person's been like, no, that's a stupid idea. Don't do that. But in the very last, like as soon as they're given the extraction points, suddenly they, they both have very different ideas about how they should get to the extraction points. Mm. One of them is like, oh, we should contact our family members to drive us there directly. And the other guy is like, no, no, we should use members of the public. So they're both like, all right, screw you. I'm going to go my own way, right. basically. It's like all of a sudden these people who've been getting on the entire show in the finale okay. fall out. Weird, that, isn't it? Yeah. And then as soon as the couple get to the extraction points, all of a sudden the guy like gets down on one knee and he's like, such and such, will you marry me? As, like, the hunters are, like, running through the harbour trying to catch them. He's just down on one knee proposing. Okay, they try like, to make no it cinematic. There's way. Yeah. It's, like, a hundred grand at stake. Well, I mean, well, I would recommend a TV show to both of you called Unreal. And it's a drama series about a reality show that's kind of uh, modelled after The Bachelorette and The Bachelor. Right, okay. And it's about the, the production crew that manipulate people and have to contrive narrative. Because, yeah, no reality show is a reality no. show. Yeah, and we I don't want it that. to sound like I'm complaining, like, oh, this reality show isn't depicting... Re-. Like, none of them do. Oh, no, that's it's a Absolutely fair, it's a fair complaint. Do. Like, it's a completely vacuous yeah, medium. Yeah, exactly. You know? But it's just, like, the, 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 the you have to suspend your disbelief so much, it seems, with Hunted and the Heist, yeah. that it just doesn't seem worth the, the hassle. Because mm-hmm. I was going to say, like, you don't... Like, the reality doesn't stack up, but also... These are all real people. Mm. These aren't actors. So with the moments where you're, you're doing like mm. these clearly like not scripted, but like these sort of like predetermined sequences where like the end of the show when they manage to get to the extraction points mm. and they sort of shoot off into the ocean and you've just got all of the hunters just like looking at the screens, looking kind of nonplussed. Mm. And then in one in the background, one of them just goes, shit, and then like punches a door. <laughs> It's just so. This is like, what I mean by it's made yeah, for stupid so people. Because you said it requires so much suspension of disbelief. I suppose my point would be its intended demographic suspends their disbelief as a point of principle. Right. And like I think in a. Uh, I will believe it. Damn it. No, not yeah. not not that. That don't even have the faculty that would doubt it. You know? Right. I mean the kind of people that um in that Fry and Laurie sketch to quote the Fry and Laurie sketch credulous gits <laughs> who just <laughs> believe whatever they're shown, yeah, yeah. you know? Because you know that uh, a vast, okay, I won't say majority, a significant proportion of the audience believes that what's yeah, unfolding is genuine. I've seen, like, I've looked at reviews and there's, it seems to be pretty evenly split. The people who who genuinely like the show and the people Yeah, this who is reviews like, now. This, this is, bullshit, is reviews. There's no way this is real. But I think that's just a failure of imagination, isn't it? On our parts, a failure to comprehend just how empty-headed some people are. Right. I think, you know, there are people who just think it's real. I know them. I grew up with these people. They're like, oh, it's so mad, isn't it? What's going on there? It's flipping fucking hell. It's tense, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We just aren't of that ilk, are we? God, this sounds really fucking <laughs> arrogant and pompous now, but no, there is stupid television, you know, yeah. and it's for stupid people. Yeah. It sounds like it's also interesting how, at least from what I've seen, the people who seem like the most capable or the people who would seem like they would be the best at this sort of thing, they're always mm-hmm. the people who seem to get captured first. Okay. So, for example, one of the people who conducted the heist was an ex-police officer. So you think like, oh, there's a police officer. There's no way they're going to catch her. Mm. So they catch her in like the first fucking episode. Do you know how they capture? Because it turns out that she decided to buy everyone's burner phones with her own credit card. <laughs> So they just traced her credit card, saw that she bought like five phones and was like, oh, fuck, it's you then. Yeah. That is pretty stupid. Okay. It is really stupid. But that's another thing that annoys me is that the hunters always seem to be skeptical when they should be skeptical. Like they always have the correct lead. Right. They never seem to rope anyone in who has nothing to do with the show. I know this stuff would be omitted in editing anyway, even if somehow you managed to get like yeah, yeah, yeah. a 100% accurate depiction of the reality of the situation. Mm. You would just cut out a moment where the hunters arrested the wrong guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the fact that like whenever the the hunt, the hunt the people being hunted do something and the hunters are like, that doesn't seem quite right. I bet they've done this. And they they guess exactly what, mm. the, they seem to guess exactly what has happened. Well, here's that, because you say, I think it would be omitted in editing. 
But that would be interesting to me, of like them going and arresting the wrong guy. This guy who now, in his life, is inexplicably being pulled aside yes. and being questioned by these people. That's interesting to me. And seeing them fail, you know, especially if you're, it wants you to root for certain people. If you're rooting for, you know, these guys and they're getting away with it, you're going to like that. Yeah. That's going to be interesting. But realistically, the producers are going, right, yeah, it's all well and good that you have free reign, but we've got a fucking budget. So here's a clue. Yeah. Here's a lead. Here's a bit of footage. That's what it is, isn't it? Like, you know, because mm. um, I would personally, I'd want to see all the the false trails and the red herrings and yeah. the mistakes. I think it's also a case of they, the producers have clearly said to the people who are being hunted, oh, you should do something to like taunt mm. the hunters. Because what happened, there's like one guy, I think Ishi, his name was, in the heist, they robbed this bank in Northumberland and they show like a map of where the police station is. And where all the people are in relation to that. Right. And Ishii is like way the fuck over there. He's like nowhere near where the hunters are. Right. And they cut to him. You, you don't see him for the first couple of episodes. And then they cut to him in like episode three and he's like, oh yeah, no one's- on a, on a beach in Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh yeah, I've just gone to work normally and like no one's come to get me. So I guess I'm all right then. Okay. Um, But then all of a sudden, I think it's in episode four or whatever episode it is. It doesn't matter. But all of a sudden he's like, oh, I'm worried that if the hunters- were to come to my, like, hometown, people would sell me out. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to donate a portion of my money to the local chip shop so that they can give out free meals Mm. to the community and basically buy their trust. Right. So he does this. Word gets out on social media. The hunters see this. They go to the chip shop. Mm. They arrest him. They see him on the CCTV, and that leads them to his money. Like, if he just kept his head down and not done anything, he'd have been fine. But the moment he does something... You know, the moment he surfaces his head, the hunters are like, right, we know it's you. We're going to fucking yeah. pull you off the street now. Yeah. There's yeah. like a moment as well where like a, it, one of the other people involved in the heist, like bake a cake taunting the hunters and they go to a beach and they sort of tell the hunters, oh, go to this beach. But they stick around. Right. So the hunters almost arrest them because they have to run away because they get, when they get there. In, they in all the honesty, beach. George, why do you care? Well, like I said, I-, I Why I, don't you I, write I, a I letter? Have... Write a letter. <laughs> write a letter. Complain to Channel 4. They've gone too Maybe far. we should all uh, apply. Go on the run for three weeks. If it's happens. real, I'll happily do it. Not if it's <laughs> I mean, some scripted bullshit. Looking for contestants according to Wikipedia. Yeah. Well, what would you rather do? Would you rather do the heist or hunted? Um, hunted. I mean, with the heist, the only additional thing, right, is that you rob. Yeah, a bank. you have to rob a bank in the beginning, but that happens at the very start. Like that's clearly scripted because there's no preparation. Yeah, yeah, say, yeah, yeah. If I don't get to keep the money, then no. Uh, well, no, that's the thing. If you because you rob the bank and you get the money immediately. Yeah, you have to spend a little bit of it, but if they capture you, you have to give that money back, and presumably you also have to reimburse them for the money that they that you've already spent. I don't know. This the show was very um, vague about that. Mm, okay, because uh, surely, like, why don't you just spend the hundred grand immediately, and then if you lose, just don't give the money back. You yeah, know? I, mean, I I wouldn't want any complication really. I like the the simplicity of you're just on the run and yeah. you've got to. But that's capture. more. That's the thing that with that you're constantly on the move and you're running about and you like you have no resources yeah. at your disposal. Whereas with the heists, like you could basically just go home afterwards. And so long as you're careful, the hunters need never know where you are. You could just live your normal life, but no, with like a hundred grand. Yeah, in your first pocket. place you check is the person's home. No, but they don't know who they're looking for on the heist. In hunted, they do, but in the heist, they have to figure out who you are first, and then they come looking for you. I'd rather do hunted. I, I like I, it. Might, it's probably more difficult, but just on a kind of entertainment level, I prefer the idea of starting with nothing, and you've got your wits and your you know your resourcefulness is what you're right, relying okay. on to. Uh, survive Mm. you know given that the pretext is that you're on the run you're a fugitive yeah are you given any legal leeway for things that you might have to do along the way because i would think (laughs) i would think outside the box on this one i would genuinely right scope out like prostitutes late at night right (laughs) right okay get one to take me to a pimp right somehow i'll cause a scene or whatever yeah yeah. and then ask if he know uh, you know get see if he knows anyone who uh deals weapons I'd buy a gun. I'd lure a I'd lure a hunter to a about no isolated location. Yeah. I'd get them a gunpoint. I'd force them to tell me everything they knew. Get their phone with all like their contact details for their family yeah. members and stuff, and threaten to kill the family if they continue to pursue you. Like people need to be thinking outside the box on this one, not just like I I, I got to run away and get on this train. Right. Now, fuck that. I'm going. Deep. All, I'm all getting I'm information say on these people. Jordan, you really do sound quite invested in this show. And Sam, you should definitely sign up for it. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't think it's kosher, Sam. I don't think you could do shit like that. Why yeah, not? Yeah, Sam's a rule breaker, you know. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, like, what kind of show? It's like, right, okay, you fugitives, right? 
Like, you can't break the law, though. You gotta be like, you've gotta be legal fugitives. <laughs> you gotta follow the rules. No, that's exactly what it is. That's bollocks. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't want to see this. <laughs> So, series three. Yes. I made substantial notes. Okay. We will tackle it uh, episode by episode. I think that's... Have you made substantial notes because substantial notes were warranted? Or did you feel No, no filler, to... no compunction, just... Well, it's my thoughts in real time, basically, as they occurred to me. Okay. Uh, all the salient notes are there. Okay. Okay, how should we do this? I guess maybe... You guys can give me your opinions on the episodes as we're going through. Okay. Do you want to start episode by episode or do you want to give a broad, this is what I thought of series three? No, know? I want to do episode by episode because I think it would be giving it away right, to okay. uh, say what I thought. Wants to keep you, you didn't in like it, did you? He wants to keep you in suspense, George. <laughs> <laughs> I want to keep you in suspense. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Well, it's going to become pretty clear pretty early on what my general opinion is. I, I yeah, I fear it might. <laughs> Right, The Runaway Bride, which is the Christmas special. It's all right. Okay. <laughs> Ever the wordsmith, Eddie. No, I, I don't have much more. Like, it's a better thing that Catherine Tate's done. Okay. In the context of the show or in general? In general. Okay, all I right. I have criticised the Catherine Tate show a couple of times. Have you? Uh, not on the podcast, but I have. Yeah, not on the podcast, definitely. Not a fan of the Catherine Tate show. Am I bothered? You know, you don't like that? No, because I could do it at school and that annoyed me. What, a f- what does the nan say? What a fucking liberty. Yeah, that's it, yeah. You don't like that, do you? It just gets repetitive and annoying. Well, that's sketch shows, though. No, they're not. They, they, they're sketch shows, then there are sketch shows. There's a bit of Fry and Laurie and that Mitchell and Webb look, and then there's Little Britain and the Catherine Yeah, Page. okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll concede Fry and Laurie. And- yeah. Oh, yeah, have either yeah. of you been getting, like... A lot of Mitchell and Webb sketches recommended to you over YouTube recently. No. No. I've been getting loads of recommendations, and they all seem to be eerily, like, appropriate, given what's happening in the world at the moment. Okay. They're all, they all have this, like, apocalyptic slash PSA, like, edge to them. You know, it's like, like the, the, the post, uh, the post-apocalyptic game show. Like, we don't talk about the event. Yeah. And there's yeah, one yeah. where, like, um, like, Robert Webb has started working from home, and David Mitchell is like, of oh, you, um got past the wanking stage yet right and they start like talking about like he's giving him advice on how to get past yeah that. is that you just confessing to wankathons no no i'm just- <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay yeah george have you got past the wanking stage yet <laughs> otherwise known as your 20s <laughs> um yeah the runaway bright what do you think of it george um i didn't i didn't rewatch it i sh- maybe i should have rewatched it did you rewatch any of the series? I rewatched a few, yeah. Okay, okay. The Christmas specials in general, I have a sort of, I have a weaker memory of those. Yeah. Um, I think it was all right from what I remember. It's a bit of a tonal okay. shift if you're watching, if you've just watched like Doomsday and then your next thing, the next thing you see is The Runaway Bride. It's a bit of a shift. Yeah. It's very like goofy and sort of like almost, um, what, what's the word I'm thinking of? It's not a spoof, but it's sort of exaggerated and silly. It's kind and of farcical. Um, fast, that's it. Yeah, yeah. He feels slapstick. Kind of until yeah. he yeah. tries to kill um, a giant spider. Okay, well, I I didn't like the episode. I, I didn't think you would. No, it, it's it's too much. I mean, Catherine Tate in it is very big. Her energy. Her energy. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Not her size. Yeah. I recently listened to a Christopher Eccleston interview, wherein he said that he wanted to play the doctor because he wanted to do something for children. So that has kind of bolstered my kind of reading that it's that it's made pr- you know for children basically we are the, we're not going to be able to dispel no, you I, this delusion are we it's not a delusion it, it, it the guy who play it is for kids i'm sorry that it, it does flirt with darker themes it's but not it's a ch- just for kids no though. it is it is jordan it's a children's no, it's show no no, Eddie, no back me up here. listen 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 in the same way that pixar films Eddie, back me up here listen to me in the same way that pixar films pixar films are great and we enjoy them and they're brilliant but they're still for children you can you can say oh it's it's for families because older people can enjoy it as well, but th- there's like a children's book, so an, ad- an adult could read that and enjoy it. It doesn't matter; it's still a children's book. For all intents and purposes, Doctor Who is a children's show. It is made for children. Sure, older people can watch it and enjoy it, but it is a children's show. Anyway, the fact that he Eddie, said it has made me comfortable uh, continuing back me up, with that for fuck's sake <laughs> with that idea. And I think even for even for Doctor Who, which is a children's show. I still think that she is too big. 
Um, I've said, I said in series one, I think you even agreed with it, that like there are moments where the show plays to children. And it, broadly speaking, yes, it's not a very mature show no in the same way that like something that's aimed at an older audience is mature Mm -hmm. but there are also instances where it feels like like oh in this episode we're appealing to the kids in this episode we're appealing to like older members of the audience in this episode we're sort of like mixing it a little bit no it's not just all kids no no no, but you're you're confusing children's show with childish i'm not saying it's always childish yeah i mean let's take the incredibles as an example in the incredibles a children's film there's a moment in that where Mr. Incredible is under the impression that his entire family has just been murdered. Yeah. Right? I'm not saying that that, that it doesn't deal with darker themes and with more adult themes. I'm just saying that functionally, for the most part, I would call it a children's show. uh, My argument is that I think it's a family show rather than a kid show. That's where I... Yeah, it's a family show. Why why is it family? Why why can you not... Meet us there, Sam. What do you mean by family show? Tell me what you mean by that. Why is that distinct from my definition of a children's show? Because, I mean, the thing, I, I don't take it from what the show was made originally for, which was it was made for Saturday evenings with people watching it like after dinner. That's what it was like mm. originally double. It right. was made for families to sit on the sofa with and just watch it as a whole. Mm-hmm. So the whole point was that it was supposed to be tailored to there would be stuff for kids. There would be stuff for teens. There would be I, bits for adults. I don't know why you both of you, well, you especially, Joe, balk so heavily at my designation of it as a children's show. That's not a criticism. I'm not criticizing it by saying it's, it's a children's show. It's the fact that you're sticking to it so rigidly. I'm, I'm, I'm interested I, uh, why you're so, like, this is the hill you're dying on. No, no. Know? I'm saying that it's made mainly for children. That's all I'm saying. It's made mainly, I'm not saying adults can't enjoy it or shouldn't enjoy it. I'm saying it's, ma- it's main audience is children. I, I, is it... Are you trying to justify your fandom of it as an adult by trying to say, no, it's a family show? No, no, no. Like, I, I'm, I'm not saying it shouldn't be enjoyed. No, no, because I'm a fan of Sonic. And I would say that Sonic yeah. is not like chil- not like little children, although there are instances of that, but it's definitely like aimed towards kids. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not like ashamed of Doctor Who and it must be okay. a family show for me to... Right. It's just I'm surprised that you're like... This is the third uh, episode we've talked about Doctor Who and you're still like... No, it's definitively a kid's show. You know? Because, well, this episode in particular, I know it's goofier than... It's the goofiest I've seen so far. Yes. I get that, but it sort of highlighted that for me because it's energy. And like Catherine Tate's performance in that episode, I don't know how you could really enjoy it if you weren't a child. Because it's re- it's over the top. It's like, it's massive that. And was, that Catherine Tate thing of talking like that and being very... I was like, whoa, okay. I just, I'm not on the level with this. Yeah. That's all. Again... It's not a criticism. It's just a way of me thinking about it so I can judge it accordingly, you know? Yeah, okay. Um, and again, I'm not saying it's even for young children. I'm saying it's for... It's probably for the same audience that Harry Potter is. 7 to 13, 14. Like, that's your main kind of... Yeah, well, we've, we've got a friend who's not going to be very happy with that statement. Why? Well, do, yeah, oh, yeah. it's for, okay. like, young people. But I, I don't think he or she would deny that uh, I mean, it's obvious. It's Harry Potter are children's books, aren't they? They are to be found in the children's section of uh, young shops. adult fiction. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know exactly what the demographic. It's not young adult fiction, is it? No, no, it is. No, it's not. I'm pretty no, sure it's, it's young adult. Young fiction. adult fiction is stuff like Darren Shan, um, some of the Anthony Horowitz stuff. Like, I, the, 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 right? There's Mister Men, there's Harry Potter, and then there's Darren <laughs> Shan. Right? You no, know, I completely right. forgot. I read about Harry Darren Potter. Shan. You know, ah, oh, those were good. <laughs> I read Harry Potter when I was like seven, eight. You know, I was that age. Okay. And I would say that up to your teens. You know, it's also for adults. Like those films are really enjoyable and they they're great. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, yeah, it's very whimsical. The episode it it, it introduces this music that's very Chaplin esque. Oh, that was a bit off. Is it Donna's theme, Eddie? Uh, Do you remember? I'm not sure. Okay, because Donna has a theme that reoccurs in series four, and yes, it's very like plinky plonky. Yes, exactly. So it might be that. Yeah, well, it's this episode maybe because it's a Christmas episode. It's it's pitching it significantly younger than it is usually. Th- this is for kids, you know. Yes. No. I, yeah, I wouldn't dispute that. Yeah. What else have I got here? This might be a bit choppy because, like, like, like I said, I've, it's all notes. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, okay, so you know, you know, when they go to um, her reception, her wedding reception. Yes. Yeah. And I think Lance is her uh, fiance. Yes. And he's yeah. dancing with another woman there, and she's like, "Yeah, oh my god, you've got ahead without me." The woman he's dancing with is gorgeous. 
And I'm just thinking, well, at that, at that, at that moment, I was thinking, what the fuck is he doing with Catherine Tate? <laughs> if he can get a woman of that standard. Yeah, it does uh, get, it does kind of get quickly. addressed later on. Yes. Yeah. There's a moment where they're all, uh, the three of them are on segways and they're all giggling. And that was a bit cringe. I found that a bit cringy. Okay. Um, I will say for the entirety of this season, there is significantly less cringe. Yes. There are moments, but there are there are, there are a few. I feel fewer. like you'll have to uh, see if you agree with this, Sam, and you as well, Eddie, I suppose. Mm. David Tennant seems angrier this season. Yes, definitely. I think that is intentional. I know it's intentional, but that's something I noticed more on the rewatch, is he seems to be a lot angrier. And I kind of forgot how quickly he could blow up and how like easy yeah. it was to trigger his temper. Mm. Yeah. Um, I've got no time for the Empress of the Rachnos. <laughs> Just give it a rest, love. It's like, again, I know this is pitching it a bit younger, but the constant like, I'm evil, really evil. It's, oh, Jesus, just yeah. shut the fuck the up. Voice is, also, yeah. did the Rachni brush their teeth? Because her teeth are pearly white. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a little it's, detail. It's like one thing she does, you know, she spins webs, she cleans her teeth, she loves her life. She cleans her teeth. Um, there are a few, like, the Empress uh, mentions Christmas a few times, like, before she descends on Earth, there's this thing about, like, I tire high above, I, I tire, I tower high above on Christmas night, and then she talks about her Christmas dinner. Uh, why are aliens concerned about human religious festivals? <laughs> how do they, well, how do mean, they even know about that it? So that the Rachnos, a Rachnos ship is uh, the core of the planet. Yeah. So they've been here from the very beginning. So yeah. I don't know whether we're supposed okay. to infer that they um, have sort of been observing humanity all this time or whether they, I suppose, yeah. they might even be instrumental in some traditions of humanity. All, I'm, sa- I don't all know. I'm saying is no matter how you look at it, they would have definitely run out of food on that ship and they would have died her children. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But at what point do you stop, you know, just like, ah, fuck it. Just Doctor Who. Let it happen. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of that, obviously. Yeah. Um, the, I love the, the moment where Lance turns and you find out that he's been working with the Empress and he just launches into this um, assault on Catherine Tate's character. Yeah. It's like, oh, you're bored. I-, I was so with him. He completely <laughs> had my sympathy. I was just like, because everything he's saying, I was relating to, he's like, you stupid fucking magazines and your stupid rumors and watching soaps and like, oh, is it interminable? And I was like, yes, Lance, I'm with you right now. Um, also, is that, is that why you didn't like this episode? Is because the character you most related to died? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, is it just me, or is it tacitly implied that Lance is fucking the Spider Queen? <laughs> what? Because at one point, I think Catherine Tate says to him, "What you, you prefer to be a consort?" Or maybe the Doctor says it, and then he says it's better than a night with her. So was that implying that? He is having sex with the Spider Queen? I don't know if it was implying it, but if he was, I mean, fair play to the man. <laughs> okay. Um, right, at the end of the episode where he offers Donna, you know, passenger ship. Yes. This is effectively what she says. All right, I can't go with you. The scope of, like, reality is brutally intimidating, and I harbor suspicions that you're a sadistic psychopath. But I'll cook you Christmas dinner. <laughs> I'll happily cook you Christmas dinner. Because <laughs> when he's killing, um, you know, the, the Empress and all her children, you know, he's there's a moment where she's like, okay, that's enough now. And he's committing to it. Yeah. And in that moment, she's like, you need help, dude. Yeah. But so she thinks he's like a, a, a cold-hearted killer. But then she's like, I'll come in for some turkey though. Come on. <laughs> well, come he did on save it. her life, you know? There's nothing noble about hypocrisy, Donna. I just want to put that out there. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> That was horrific. Okay. I mean, um, she's still indebted to him in the sense that she's alive. She wouldn't have been alive, you know? Yeah, okay. Um, So one of the things that I've done is I typically, I'm not a fan of the Doctor Who episode titles. Okay. So I've come up with alternatives. Some of them are in jest. Some of them are serious. Mm -hmm. uh, Most of the puns. So my title for this episode is uh, Weblock. And also I've given a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down to each episode. This episode is a thumbs down. Oh, okay. Why is it called Weblock? Explain it to me. Oh, Wedlock, but also Web. Oh, right. Okay. I should I should have got that. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was my fault. It's all right. Okay. Episode one of series Smith three. Jones. <laughs> Smith and Jones. Smith and Jones. I already prefer Martha. I know this is heresy to you, George, but <laughs> I I quite like Martha. I gotta be honest. What, what do you like about Martha? Steel Man Martha for me. Explain why... Steel man her. Yeah, explain why you like her. I, I don't really need to steel man her because these are my genuine c- convictions, but... Okay. Yes, okay, she is not colourful. No jokes, please. <laughs> She's not colourful, 
there aren't there isn't much to her she is quite bland and a blank canvas mm. but i just found I, I i quite like being in her company whereas i didn't with rose okay i didn't like rose as a character as a human being whereas i do like martha mm. okay it, it's a bit more um palatable to me that she would go around the cosmos with this guy because you know she has a family but it, it's like her choice she's not leaving anyone behind there's uh, like she, there's no Mickey in this picture. Yeah. Well, like the 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 whole the the sort of the thrust of this series and their relationship in the series is that she's kind of she's secretly got the hots for the Doctor, but the Doctor's just not interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's not interested, but he's also sort of treating her like a rebound, and he's not. I don't think he's quite aware of the implications of like what yeah. he's doing. No, it's totally one sided. I mean, it's all jumping ahead a little bit, but one of the problems I had. Um, kind of manifest in episode two is in episode one they seem to make a promise that there will be no romantic affiliation and then they break it in episode two so I found that quite uh, disappointing what's the promise? well in episode one she says like don't worry I'm not interested I'm only interested in humans yeah you're not my type it felt like a statement it's like oh good they're saying from the off that that this is not going to become a romantic thing yeah but then as soon as the second episode rolls around She's clearly got the hots for him and annoyed that he's not reciprocating it. Yeah. So that, that was a bit disheartening. Right, you know when they <laughs> when they are teleported to the moon? Yes. yes. Uh, Mr. Stoker, the physician, is looking out at the impending Jadoon. Yes. Why the fuck's he got binoculars in a hospital? <laughs> well, it's, it's standard equipment, isn't it, for a doctor? <laughs> binoculars? Yeah. Are they? Okay. Creep. Um, I like the image of a hospital on the moon. Mm-hmm. Also space rhinos. I like space rhinos. Yes, Jadoon. You finally met the Jadoon. I, I like I like the Jadoon. I quite like the Jadoon. I like the Jadoon a lot, yeah. They're, they're my kind of creature, uh, alien. Well, they're, they're recognisable, but it's like, it's sort of just two ideas fused. Rhino cop. Yes. <laughs> like, I, yeah. I like that. <laughs> you know, I think his name is, is it Morgan Stern or something? One of the doctors. He's very quick to become a collaborator. He becomes a good German really quickly because he gets scanned and they're like, he is innocent or whatever. Yeah. And then he's just going, he's with them, accompanying them around the hospital going, it's fine, it's just a scan. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. He's like such a, you know, cut, he bends over straight away. He's like a Frenchman or something. Um, a good German Frenchman. A German Frenchman, a yeah. Good German a good German Frenchman. Frenchman. Yeah. Um, I looked up whether the Jadoon predate this episode and they don't. No, no. This makes me think that they were generated solely to allow the line Jadoon platoon upon the moon. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like they were invented Light for the line. Probably. And I'm okay with that. Um, he expels radiation via his feet. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I like that. That's the level that I'm comfortable with, with this show. How? How is that? How did that pass <laughs> under your, um, I'll, I'll allow it barrier? I don't know. It just did. Maybe I was in a good mood. Who knows? Okay. Oh, the Jadoon would put anyone in a good mood. Yeah. You know? Yeah, well, it's it, a lot of it is taking the boxes. It, it's taking my comfort boxes in the sense of it's what I'm comfortable with with Doctor Who. So, a wanted alien fugitive who killed a princess of a galactic dynasty that's hiding out on Earth. That's the kind of universe building that I like. Okay, because it's never really said. It, it might they might literally say, "Oh, it was Princess Blah Blah of the Blah Blah Clan." It's like, no, this is good. This is alluding to things that aren't really present in this episode. Yeah. But aren't just throwaway as well. Mm. Um, I like that. I've got here a nice little thing with the tie, but I don't know uh, what. Oh, he shows when up at he the shows start. up at the very beginning of the and episode, he gives the tie. I like that. Yeah, that was good. It's nice when it's nice when a time travel show does incidental stuff like that, where you sort yes. of like you you you're kind of experiencing the time travel in real time, if that makes sense. Yes, a, a kind of a human linearity. Yes, yeah. exactly. I like stuff like that. Um, so my alternate titles for this episode. Okay. Code Blue Moon is probably the one I'll stick with. Okay. Uh, but then I wanted to base one on a song from The Dark Side of the Moon, the Pink Floyd album. Yes. Uh, so I've chosen, and infer from this what you will, uh, a song called Any Colour You Like. Um, my other... <laughs> <laughs> my other episode title is uh, Keratin Star, um, because keratin is the uh, material that rhino horns are made of, and tin star is obviously like a sheriff's Oh, badge. okay. All right, that's nice. So, yeah. Keratin Star. But Code Blue Moon, I think, is probably what I would yeah, go with. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah. Uh, overall, this episode is a thumbs up. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Okay. The Shakespeare Code. Yep. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, you're not a fan of this one, George. I'm not a fan of it. I, it kind of falls into um, yeah. I've I've, I've expressed my um, disdain for musicals before. Yes, theater can sometimes get wrapped up in that as well. Just like okay. when 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 they're sort of in the um, when they, when they're in the Globe Theater and they're doing like they, they got the people on stage reading out the the lines and it's all very theatrical. That kind of stuff gets me as well, where I'm just kind of like, eh, okay. I, don't, I don't like this. You don't like Shakespeare then, is what you're saying? It's not that I don't like Shakespeare. I don't like Shakespeare being performed, if that makes sense. <laughs> I don't like that kind okay. of theatrical, over-the-top delivery, where it's like, this okay. is very delivered. This is very, this is being performed. Okay. You know? Well, let me jump to my general opinion of the episode then. Okay. I like it. How dare you? <laughs> I didn't think this would happen, I'll be honest. Okay. I thought there'd be plenty I didn't I wouldn't like that you would. I didn't think I'd like stuff you didn't. Okay. What's your opinion of it, Eddie? I like it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I I like this. <laughs> have you have you always liked it or do you like it now that Sam likes no, no, it? No, no, no. I <laughs> I mean, I'm a fan of Shakespeare, so there is that. Yeah. So I was I okay. I liked to find yeah, the, as am I. the introduction of that. Um I mean, the the, the witches are a bit kooky, but I I kind of I kind of like them cuz witches aren't really in it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, as I've said before, I I like the historical episodes. Yes. I seem to enjoy those more. And I like it when they integrate. So basically, the idea of doing a time travel Shakespeare episode where the plot is informed by Shakespeare's mm. works. Okay, yeah. Okay. I like stuff like that. You get a lot in Scooby-Doo cartoons and yeah. stuff. And it's very clever. Uh, I like, you know, I like that. I like Shakespearean dialogue. Um, I like that flavor. Yeah. Um, at the beginning, Lilith, the, the witch... Hmm directly addresses the audience mm. i wasn't okay with that no that happens in shakespeare though uh, so that could be part of the trappings of, oh i suppose mm, i thought of that it's so yeah. like a chorus yeah yeah. Oh, yeah yeah okay all right fair enough i now accept it completely <laughs> okay. um yeah. i hadn't thought of martha's ethnicity um until the show addressed it yes by which i mean i hadn't it hadn't occurred to me like oh if they go back through history yeah her race is going to be an issue but i genuinely hadn't thought of that until they brought up and th- these were the heady days of was it is it oh seven yeah. the mm. series? It's treated exactly how it should be. Yes, um, it's I think it's dealt with in a sentence in this. I re- yeah, I really like the way they deal with it because mm. she when they initially go back, Martha says to the doctor like I'm not exactly white. Is that going to be a problem? And the doctor's like, well, I'm not even human. Yeah, you know, yeah. just yes. walk around like you own the place. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like it's London. There's a hodgepodge. There's low everyone of different. Yeah, stripes exactly. Here, you know? And also, um, I think there's a bit of tension with Shakespeare initially. Yeah, like he sort of says something that's very like, oh, you're not supposed to say that. Well, he, he calls her like. Um, like Nubian or something, or like my Princess Africana or something like that. Yeah, it's like yeah, so you would they would have yeah. spoken like and she's that. She's like, yeah. you want me? And the doctor's just like, oh yes, political correctness gone mad. He's just kind of like, yeah, let's not. We don't need to. <laughs> we don't need to talk off, about yeah, it. Let's it's just fine. not deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I like that a lot. I feel like well, we'll find out, I suppose. But more contemporary episodes that are going to be dealing with that issue, I feel, is not going to do it so gracefully. No, um, <laughs> no, it does no. not. Spoilers. And there, there are things like that. Occasionally, I find myself watching like a '90s sitcom and just thinking, "You couldn't do that now." And there was an example of that in this episode where they're watching the play, and Martha says, "And those are men dressed as women, yeah." And the Doctor says, oh, "London never changes." You couldn't say anything <laughs> like something like that. No, you know, I just lo- I like oh for simpler times. Yeah. Um, if I didn't know better, I would have guessed this was written by Mark Gatiss. Okay. It's not. No, it's not. Uh, but it's got that thing of playing with uh, the kind of the archaic language and yeah. that sort of thing. It's very nicely written. Okay. Gotta say. I like its kind of theme and its presentation of the idea that words have power. This could be abused in the sense of, you know, you, an idiot leftist plank could say, <laughs> oh yeah, words have, words words do have power. This justifies the existence of microaggressions mm, and that sort of right. thing. But I like the idea that the, the which is ultimately defeated by the power of language. Yeah. Obviously, as a writer, that is very I do, appealing. In a rather childish way, I do like that this is the way they deal with what happened to the play Love Labour's Wife. Yes. In the, yeah. the, it just ended up in that sort of riff. Of <laughs> yeah. And that's why we never got the play. Because, yeah, I, I, George, I genuinely don't know how much you know of Love Labour's One. I know that there's like a missing yeah, uh, it, yes. work. Yeah, so yeah. it's a yeah, legitimate missing play. And there's various theories that go towards it. Is part of um, that, or is there a crossover with the theory that Shakespeare never wrote any of his plays, and Shakespeare is just a pseudonym or something? I mean, there's all there's all there's all sorts. That is, that is a theory, right? That Shakespeare never existed. Oh, yeah, not yeah, not yeah, that yeah. he never existed, that he um, plagiarized. Yeah, I see. Uh, that it was a there was another bloke. I can't remember his name now. 
I'm going to quickly look that up, actually. Oh, Eddie, can you look it up if you're yeah. online? So, am I looking up the other guy? The, the name of the guy that supposedly wrote the Shakespeare Just plays. Jiggle Knife. What? <laughs> I don't know. I was trying to, like, Shakespeare, oh, Jiggle oh, Knife. Oh, Shakespeare. <laughs> okay, all right. Billy Jiggle Knife. Billy Jiggle yeah. Knife. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Mark's name. Oh, no. you, do you just mean Christopher Marlowe? Yeah, him. Yeah. Christopher Marlowe. Yeah. Anywho. Yeah. I like that Elizabeth the first. <laughs> God's sake. <laughs> uh, I like that Elizabeth the first has got a grudge against him that's never really explained. I don't know if this alludes to earlier. Who, um, but. I don't know. Do you know, Eddie? I know where it ends up. Oh, okay. okay. I don't know where it ends right, up. Yeah. Is it what I'm thinking of with um, the. I can't say it, can I? <laughs> No, you can't. Not if it's a if, I, if I just say the word Joanna Page. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was. Yeah. yeah there that we works. <laughs> okay. Well, again, I don't know if this is, if it's a carry on from the older stuff, but I like that she walks in. She's like, "You, you, you fucking cunt," <laughs> and then he has to <laughs> run away. I like that. I was like, "Oh, cool. Yeah." Because he's, of course, he would have met Elizabeth the first. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So when I again, this is kind of like a like I said, a real time unfolding of my thoughts. At that point, I thought, right, I don't enjoy the show, but I can appreciate it. Okay. I can appreciate the writing and I can look at it kind of objectively. I feel that way about Taxi Driver. Even if I'm not... Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> it's interesting that like, e- Doctor Who is the thing for you. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm not enjoying it on the level that it wants you to enjoy it, but I can definitely appreciate okay. it, you know? So this, my alternate title for this episode, I've got two. Yep. Uh, one is... Why, why was that a pun? <laughs> I said I said I've got two and you went at. Did I? Oh yeah, no, I okay, thought you were right. just like just reassessing your own work. Like that's not a pun. Why did I write that? I thought that's what you Oh no. No, no. I've I've got two different names. Okay, go on. Sorry. Um so one is uh, by any other name. Okay. If you know the quote is it's a rose by any other name. Yeah. See what I did uh, there? Right. So you're you're you're, you're, you're a season or... late, mate, but yeah, sure, why not? What do you mean? Because Rose is gone now. Yeah, so this is a rose by another name. Martha is Rose by okay. any other name. Right, See what okay, I'm doing there? Whatever. Okay. There's that, but the one I'm, I'm going to stick with is Timing Couplet. Okay. Yeah. That's that's my title for this episode. And it gets a thumbs up. Boo. <laughs> Boo. I just love it that George doesn't like it. It's class. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Gridlock. The the one we've been waiting for. Yeah. Yes. Ardlow O'Hanlon is a cat. Ard- Ardlow O'Hanlon is a cat. Ardlow O'Hanlon is a cat. Yes. Uh, well, that's that's one of my first notes, is Ardlo Hannon is a cat. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so I'm finding it a little uh, snarksome when the Doctor gets angry. Like, when he does get angry, I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay, whatever. Mm. You're silly, you're silly right, Doctor. Right, okay. Um, I'm not taking it seriously it, when he's it getting angry. It is strange, like, how, like, the vendors, the street vendors in the Undercity... Like how he's immediately like shut down, or I'm gonna like bring fury upon you. Yeah, that feels kind of like out of nowhere. Almost. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's why I found it a bit. I was sniggering derisively, mm, yeah. but I okay, I I like the idea as a sci-fi concept of stupendous congestion. Yeah, I really like that. One of my micro notes here is I understand that wankers sound their horns in actual traffic jams. Yeah. But if it took six years to travel 10 miles, <laughs> you'd think people would wind it in a bit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, just shut the fuck up! Yeah. Um, but They also, like, happen. whenever they cut to the um, the exterior CGI shots of the traffic, there's always cars moving. Yeah, that's annoying. So that's I know annoying. You, I know you need that to help create a sense of scale. And it also, like, if everything's stationary, it's just going to look like a static... It's going to look too static and too flat. Mm. But yeah, if you're traveling six miles in 10 years or whatever it is, and then you look at the outside and there are constantly cars moving, it's like, well, why? <laughs> yeah. it's a re- There's something like markedly bleak about the premise. Mm. <laughs> when I was thinking about, you know, you've got those two, the lesbian couple, the yeah. old lesbian yeah. couple. Like, they'll definitely die before they arrive at their destination. Oh, yeah. As far as they're concerned in this yeah, yeah, you know, setup. Yeah. So it's like a metaphor about losing time as you crawl towards a goal that was my takeaway oh, from interesting. it interesting okay so like when when you should be concentrating on the present but you're you know, you're focusing on getting somewhere and you're just getting older and dying in the, me- the right. meantime okay. they do kind of address the idea of this futility uh when the doctor suggests he says to like oh, what if this just goes on forever what if you've been fooled yeah you know 
and everyone's in denial about it. I didn't expect it to go deeper, but it would have been nice if it did. Like, really hammered on this idea of, yeah. you're actually going nowhere. I know what you, you mean. Know? It does feel like the, the traffic jam stuff. It's not the story. It's just a component of the episode, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. you've got, because obviously the face of Bo, it's his final appearance. So we see the face of Bo again, and then that sort of, like, hijacks the end of the story where we, he, it's sort of, you know. Yeah. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's nice to see the face of Bo again. Yes. You're a big fan of the face, face of Bo. I like, the, I like the face of Bo. Yeah. Well, um, I'm, okay, I'm ambivalent about the face of Bo. Of course you are, sir. No. But now that I know who he is, I fucking hate the face of Bo. <laughs> I now know that Captain Jack is the face of Bo. Because he can't, he doesn't age. Yeah. So he becomes a giant face. He becomes a giant head. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is that is very clearly a retrospective thing, isn't it? They didn't oh, yeah. start yeah. being like, oh, Jack is going to become the face of Bo. No. You know? Yeah. Um, it had a kind of contemporary relevance in the sense of everyone is... Uh, clustered together but isolated at the same time yeah it was a very coronavirus yeah episode, that was very know? like ooh, okay yeah <laughs> um just a little uh the writer in me uh I d- it would have been on the nose but like if you know as he's descending all the cars mm. i would have liked it if in one of the cars they were they were just sardines i would have enjoyed that <laughs> uh, visual gag <laughs> um i've got here yeah, so again i, I don't want to keep hammering this point at, but you have to understand that I'm basically reading you a real time. Yeah, that's fair yeah. enough. Uh, yeah. So my next point is it's already better than season two. Okay. Yes. Uh, you, have you specified, bear in mind, this is my real time opinion because this changes? I mean, maybe. But uh, the reason I'm specifying it is because when I've got notes like it's already better than season two, that that was me at that moment watching that episode thinking, right, this, it's already better than season two. Okay. Do you know All what right. I mean? It's not... This isn't my um, post-match uh, review of it. This is literally in the I moment. I see. Okay. So, I don't really notice David Tennant. Like, he's in the role. I don't notice him oh, as okay. the Doctor. Mm, okay. He doesn't stand out to me, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Um, when he opens up, uh, you know, the, the the ceiling of the highway, mm, yeah. and they all go... They would all be blinded by the sun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They've all been <laughs> subterranean for, like, decades. They wouldn't be able to see shit. They're all, like, looking like... Oh, the sun. I mean, if you're in the cinema for two hours, you get yeah. fucking blinded yeah. by the sun. Yeah, yeah. This is that. Also, George, I've got one note here. It's a single word. Yeah. Crabs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on the crabs? Um. Well, you barely see them, in fairness. They're kind of yeah, shrouded in the, just, in the smoke. Just their pincers. You yeah. See their pincers. Mm. That's okay. It's not so much the um uh the pincers I have a problem with. It's the... When you see a crab up close and you can see it's like face and everything, okay. that's where I'm like, yeah, I'm okay with this. It's like with spiders. Like spiders are creepy on in and of themselves, but the moment you see like their face with like their their fangs and like their eight eyes, you're like, oh, I'm I'm really not okay. Okay, with this. all right then. Uh, at the end, mm-hmm. uh, at the end, Doctor recounts memories of Gallifrey. Right, he's explaining, oh, you know, trees and blah 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 blah. Yes. Um, as he's doing this, the camera rises up into the sunlight over New New York as all the people sing a hymn. And in that moment, it became a TV show for me. <laughs> God, it, God, it really shows what how you've been approaching this, isn't it? <laughs> this show has this like really like great moment. You're like, ah, that's what television would do. Yeah, well, it t- it's just been a novel. T- like, frankly, it's been a novelty for me mostly. Okay. Uh, so at that moment, it's like, oh, good. I'm like, I felt something then. I'm a little bit invested now. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, that's kind of all. So my alternate title for this episode is Sapphic Jam. Now, if either of you don't know what sapphic is, sapphic means lesbian. So, sapphic jam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. They're not in it enough. I don't no, think. I know. But I, I think you have to appreciate that as soon as I came up with that, it couldn't be anything else. No, no I suppose. So, uh, that episode is thumbs up. Okay. Yeah. Why has it? Because like, like we said before, like you saw it ages ago. And that seems to be the one thing that stuck with you from Doctor Who is um, Ardlo Hanlon as a cat. Ardlo as a cat. Yeah. Now that you've re- learned that you've rewatched it, is there anything that sort of made you go, "Oh yes, that's why I like that episode so much"? Honestly, no. I mean, it, it wasn't that I like really liked that episode in particular before. It was just for some reason the one that stayed with me, and not stayed with me in the sense of its kind of story or its theme or anything like that or emotional impact. Just the imagery of it. Yeah. Him, him in those very claustrophobic tins, you know. I just like that for some reason. I don't know why. I can't really articulate that. That's just a 
not even an emotional response. It's just kind of like an aesthetic personal response. Okay. Um, it's it's n- like not the best by any means. It's not an episode that I imagine it is considered among the best or as a standout no, in any yeah, way. Yeah, it's not one of those episodes I hear talked about a lot. I don't think it's disliked. Yeah. But yeah, I never I never hear people talk about Gridlock. And I've never I've never found it strange that people don't talk about Gridlock, even though I do like that episode as well. No, yeah, it it is just it's it's your run of the mill episode. It feels like what an average episode of Doctor Who should be. Yeah, and I do like the idea of them kind of returning to locations that they've been to before. Yeah. But sort of like recontextualized. It's not we're literally doing the same thing again. Like it's the same environment and it's the same people, but it's um yeah. it's a different aspect of that society that you're kind of exploring, you know? Mm. Yes. Like when um um Ardlo Handlin is sort of revealed and we see his catness, his cat mm. form. Like that feels a little bit like a reveal in the sense that if you're watching this episode without having seen New Earth, it'll be a surprise. But I don't know, it was just felt like a very, for a character reveal, it was very underwhelming. And it just kind of felt like the show was almost going, yeah, we've been here before. You know what to expect. Okay. You're, you're, you're familiar with this environment. You're comfortable in it. So mm. here's, here's Ardlow handling as a cast. Yeah. That, maybe that's the right I was, I was just comfortable yeah. watching it. Yeah. Um, okay. Thumbs up. Good. Okay. Daleks in Manhattan. Okay. Okay. So the teaser is obviously the showgirl with her boyfriend, Laszlo. Yes. And then he is led into the, you know, pipe network or whatever yeah. by uh, this mysterious figure. And obviously this episode is littered with British actors trying to do New York accents. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's Doctor Who tradition at this point. Yeah. I was just waiting for the line. It never happened. It's like, hello, who's there? I was waiting for the line. Hey, quit fooling around. But it never arrived. <laughs> but I, I really wanted it. I was like, go full whole hog with this. Okay. Appropriately enough, because it's a pig, in it? Yes. Um... <laughs> Uh, I don't know if either of you picked up on this. Uh, have either of you seen Manhattan, the film Manhattan? Yes, no. we watched it on the course. We did. So when they first arrive, Rhapsody in Blue plays um, as they look up at the Statue of Liberty. And I thought that was just a nice little Manhattan reference. Uh, okay. I didn't even think of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they end up at this shanty town. Yeah, Hoover- Hooverville. Hooverville, it's called. Yes. Yeah. Um, or the poor and the dispossessed from the Great Depression, yes. right? Yeah. Um, the Wall Street crash. So you've got the le- they kind of this spirit leader who's this African-American gentleman and two people are fighting over bread and then he divides it and he starts monologuing. And my personal response to that was, oh, just divide the bread, mate. I don't need a fucking story. <laughs> so that, that wound me up a little bit. I feel like if I was in his company, he would piss me off. The guy that's got to tell a story, you know, about what, I don't know, you're walking up the stage. He's like, ah, oh, I once knew a man who walked upstairs. <laughs> like, oh, all right, all right. I didn't get that impression from him at all. No? No, I know that they're trying to like, not too subtly making it out like, oh, he's the level-headed one that yeah. sort of, like keeps the community together and mm-hmm. he his words kind of calm everyone yeah. and everyone listens to him. But I didn't get the impression that he was like a monologue. Oh, you know? well, he is. I mean, like, it's obviously done upon their arrival so that the audience can understand where this, what this place exactly, is. Exactly, yeah. I get that. But it did feel like with, within the context of the reality of that situation, <laughs> he divides the prayers like, we are all equal here. And, yeah, man, I know. I fucking live here. All right? <laughs> anyway. Uh, just, so the, the, the sorry, show just to interject a pigeon just shit me up by landing on my window so. <laughs> <laughs> oh like like New York pigeons I don't know uh, <laughs> oh. only New York has pigeons it does you know? well famously you know yes uh, the show gestures towards the anachronism of racial attitudes like I said it doesn't have to be totally realistic because that would just become easy liberal posturing and I, I get the idea that the idea is that poverty is a great equalizer but I, I didn't know how I, I don't know how I feel about so when he gives that monologue and he and he divides the bread how I feel about the white man just ceding to a black man's rule given the time in which it's set do you know what I mean yeah um I'm not personally offended that the white man uh you know ceded to his rule. Oh, uh, <laughs> I thought you were going to say like you were offended that the the white man was the thief instead of... Oh, um, no, 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 cause, no. Because you, no, no. you, can't, you can't have a black guy steal something. That's, you know, can't do that. I'm going to say nothing. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Probably going to cut it out. <laughs> but anyway, um, poverty is great equalizer, you said. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I, I buy that. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. That's all well and good. But in 1920s, 1930s America... Even then. It just wouldn't Even ha- then, I, I believe it. Okay. Nah, wouldn't happen. Is that, I don't know if that's like... I'm not saying you are. Yeah. Because um, I know you're not the person... You're not the type of person who's prone to do it. But is that sort of like... 
falling to the fallacy that everyone at a time in which there wasn't civil rights and at a time in which there was like a a divide between races Mm. is it kind of falling to the fallacy that everyone subscribed to that thinking no of course i mean that um it wasn't the case that a black man would walk down the street and every white guy would just beat the shit out of him and try to lynch him that's exactly obviously like it's entirely plausible that that white guy um that stole from the black guy like before this he was probably like sympathetic towards people of color not at all it's not it's not inconceivable it it just feels like they're they're presenting that situation as the standard aren't they they're using one microcosm to illustrate the macrocosm Mm. yes and i feel like maybe if you had one white guy there going hey shut up not obviously you can't use the n-word because it's doctor who but you know, and then going to, you know, how dare you? He's led us, you know, something like, again, I wouldn't want that because that becomes liberal grandstanding. I, I don't know what the happy medium is there, but it, it just seemed a little bit, eh, but it's not a big deal. Okay. Mm. Um, well, no, it's interesting because that's such a minor, like that's basically just uh, world building. That doesn't really feed into the episode at all. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting that that stood out to you. Yeah. Um, there are ropey accents across the board, yep. but yes. they're, they're never yeah. too bad. Okay. They're okay, you know, because it's it's New York and it's the 20s. So everyone's kind of talking a bit more exaggerated anyway, like it's an old movie, you know? Um, yeah. I feel like Tallulah was pushing it. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, she was. She is, a, she is a right drama queen. What are you doing? Yeah, what are you doing? I said, what are you doing? Yeah, that scene, her introduction scene. There, there's a lot of, um, well, I've got it written here. Hands in the air, no funny business. All right, you schmucks. Yeah. The mooses. Yeah, she gets it all in there. I, when, the, when the Daleks are introduced, I really wanted them to go, Empire State, Empire State, but they never do. <laughs> <laughs> he does say Empire State. He does say it, but n- not in an exterminate context. No. Um, the pigs are all right. I thought they were okay. Okay. Yeah, I, li- right. I like the pig people. Um, pig people, pig people. Sorry, go on. Uh, Andrew Garfield is in this episode. He is indeed. He is. He sounds a bit like Foghorn Leghorn, doesn't he? Remind me of Foghorn Leghorn. He he he's the cartoon uh, rooster that talks like this. Oh yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, it was yeah. A supr- considering the, the strength of his accent in the Social Network, which is only like three years after this. Yeah, it's like oh shit, that is a bad American accent. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, is that yeah? Makes you wonder whether that's a fault of uh, the directors. Or that that's the fault of Garfield. Because he does do a very convincing accent in social network. Oh, yeah, he does a good American accent. I mean, he's doing a, a different American accent in this. He's trying to do like a... He's from a Tennessee, Tennessee yeah. sort of. Yeah. So, I don't know. Maybe if he did that now, it would be as bad. But it was a bit surprising considering what he went on to do. Uh, it was funny to see a Dalek in an elevator. Uh, and just like <laughs> coming out adjacent to all these blueprints. Just like these ravenous empire-building, civilization decimating killer machines... I moved into the construction game. I find that quite funny. <laughs> yeah, he's like a New York mob boss. Just yeah. sort of comes out of his, you know, why isn't my building finished? Yeah. You fuck, you know? I like that they refer to themselves as a cult. Like, that's that's used, that's yeah. a term of, like, a, you know, um, cults never refer to themselves as that. Yeah. I like that they just call themselves a cult of Scarrow. Yeah. Does a cult only have a single definition? It's not like there's an archaic implication of the word cult that they're referring to, as um, opposed to what we know as cult. I don't think so. A cult is just an offshoot, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, anyway. Uh, do you th- are, are the pigs the nascent NYPD? Get it? Pigs? Right, Pli- police? Okay. Police? Them- <laughs> okay, all right. That was just a bad joke. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, at one point, the Dalek says, Daleks have no concept of worry. Now that's a good that's a good line. Yeah. But doesn't it evaporate on contact with air? It's contradicted in the episode itself because one of them is worried that they're violating the Dalek imperative. Yes. So they do worry about things. <laughs> well, okay. So the cult of Scaro, I mean you you already know this because it was sort of explored in um Doomsday. Yeah. But like the cult of Scaro, their purpose is to sort of imagine and kind of change the definition of what Daleks yes. are in some instances. Yes. Yeah. So these specific four Daleks are kind of capable of... It's not out of um, the ordinary for them to kind of experience like doubt and emotions because that's sort of their purpose to kind of do all the thinking for the Daleks in that respect. Okay, fair enough. Also, like as a kid, I I thought it was kind of cool, the idea that like Daleks were having doubts about what they were doing. Oh yeah, it's a good idea. Like I said, it was just a bit of a contradiction. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so I was thinking, why not get... I don't know if this does happen. Why not get a companion from a different time period? Like, by this point, we're familiar enough with the Doctor, so there's room to be experimental with a companion. I don't think an, I don't think an alien would work, I, but a human from the past could. the idea, I think. 
Well, they they flirt. Correctly. They flirt with the idea with Madame de Pompadour. They also flirt. They also flirt two. with the idea yes. with um, Jessica Hines in this series. Yes. Yes, they do. Oh, I'll try not to spoil it, but the snowmen, Eddie. Yeah. The companion. They, they, that seems to be like they're kind of going in that direction. But yeah, I mean, that's just that's kind of um, a low key criticism of the show in general. Is oh, why do all of his companions come yeah. from modern day London? And yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah. Anyway. So the Nazi allegory. Yes. Are we? Are we to? Are we on the understanding that the final experiment is a wink to the final solution? I think so. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, all we right. are. Okay. Well, hang on. Oh, uh, is it though? Because yes, I think final experiment, final solution. There's definitely you can draw a parallel there. But were the final experiment to be successful, wouldn't that basically destroy the Daleks? Yeah, it's, at least in their current. It's form? not equivalent in its ambitions, but it, it ju- just linguistically you know yeah those things, I was gonna make a joke about it because you know the final experiment the final solution but then it occurred to me oh no it's probably deliberate <laughs> like that they've done that deliberately yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah also they bring up the word the word transgenic is used which I thought might be a reference to eugenics but again that's just a little a little reference mm. okay oh yeah I was trying to think of um, a pun about a human Dalek like what they would be called uh, but then he just announced that he was called a human Dalek oh, sh- Surely there's a cleverer name out there than Human Dalek. Yeah. Well, see, so his yeah, his character name isn't Human Dalek. No, his character it's... name is Dalek Sec Hybrid. Okay. Oh, he's okay. Yeah. But he just says, "Isn't he? I am a Human Dalek." Yeah. And yeah. That felt okay. a bit weak. That was a bit rubbish. Um. So my alternate title for this episode is State of the Empire. Yep, I like yeah. that. That's probably the best one. Okay. Just in terms of like that could actually here, actually it? be used as the episode title. You know? Yeah. 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 Uh, thumbs up. Oh, okay. All right. No, yeah, I, yeah, I do. Lo- well, okay. Well, because the, the next episode is the second half of that, that story. Tis. So we'll talk more about it now. Yeah. Evolution of the Daleks. Evolution of the Daleks. So <laughs> it's a moment towards the start of the episode where two Daleks are uh, having a conversation about one of their doubts. And I, I love a little moment with the periscope. It swings around 180 and then swings back to check. <laughs> yeah. is what's there. Yeah. I love that. Of all the things I have written down, I have Daleks gossiping, but you have that. <laughs> I love that. I love just the, yeah, that little swing. I think they're really, I think they're pretty good at um, giving you enough, like a cooler shop effect with the Daleks. They sort of, they do enough with the, the shell mm. to sort of make you think like, oh, the Dalek is doing, like in that moment where the periscope looks around, he's obviously like checking yeah. if it's okay to speak. <laughs> Mm. And like little things like when they kind of, when uh, Sek sort of emerges from his shell and the Daleks all sort of like go back slightly. They're all clearly like, oh, fuck. Yeah. yeah. I feel like, I feel like the, I, they're not puppeteers, but whatever you call the people who like control the Dalek shells, mm-hmm. they're pretty good at like giving you enough body language to the Daleks. You know? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. The, bear with me on this one. Okay. So... I note that there was a certain thematic overlap with something else that I'm with which I'm familiar. So Stephen Fry, he wrote a novel, right, about someone going back in time and basically ensuring that Hitler would never be born by poisoning the water supply in Hitler's parents' town, right? Okay. And it's like a spermicidal pill that makes them all, you know, infertile. Yeah. But the kind of the horrible effect this has, it means that a significantly uh, shrewder and while as racist less blindly racist figurehead leads the Nazi party and then they are they manage to extract that spermicidal solution and use it to exterminate the Jews much more effectively right right and there was an overlap here in that the Daleks are very monomaniacal they're black and white they're absolutists they want the doctor dead but then you've got the human Dalek who sees the wisdom of using the doctor's intellect for his own purposes yeah, yeah. Nothing to be said about that other than I noticed the similarity. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I like that idea. Mm. But I, I feel like, because he's, he's using the wisdom of the Doctor to kind of reverse the Daleks' ambitions, yes. isn't he? Yes. Because he sort of says, now that I've sort of become a human hybrid, I see the flaw in the Daleks. Yes. And so it's time that the Dalek, maybe we should just get rid of the Dalekness. Entirely. Well, yeah, I've got, actually, that's my next note. That said, the comparison is rendered completely moot by the fact that the human Dalek is not entirely cunning uh, and self-motivated, but by a festering humanity. Yes. Okay, so I'm not saying the human Dalek looks like Jar Jar Binks, but <laughs> he definitely he definitely looks like the comic relief in a Star Wars film. Yes, he does. It's, yeah. A squinting yeah. Cyclops. Like, he'd, he'd be a smuggler you'd find in the cantina, you know? Yes. 
I also think there's a better accent they could have picked as well. What was the, I can't even remember the accent. Well, it was whoever the actor played in the first Oh, episode, Mr. Diagoras. His accent that he's using. I assume it's not his native accent. Yeah. But yeah, just this kind of really... Um, He's, he's, he's like he's quite softly spoken almost yeah and I know that considering he turns good very quickly it's probably a good thing mm-hmm. but I don't know there's just something I think Daleks in Manhattan and Evolution of Daleks I think that's a really good foundation for a Dalek story mm-hmm. through trying to evolve themselves the Daleks inadvertently sort of create something that sees the flaw in its own species and they have to like there's a moment through the episode where you think like the Daleks are obeying Sek and helping the Doctor reverse all of the work that they've done, even though it completely contradicts what the Dalek's ambition is. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a really good idea for a Dalek story, and a story in general, but I do think that the execution is a bit wobbly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Especially with the Dalek-human hybrid, it looks a bit crap. It, it does, yeah. Uh, okay, so I know that Laszlo <laughs> escaped before they could modify his mind, but that doesn't explain why he has hair. Yeah, he still looks like Laszlo. He does. He? I know this was motivated by a need to differentiate him from the other pigs. Yeah. yeah. But I quite like the idea the producers thought, right, it's not going to be possible for an audience to empathize with a pig that's a biped. Uh, so a head of hair is what distinguishes relatable from unpalatable. <laughs> like, that's what makes him not a pig, is the head of hair. Yeah. yeah. Well, at the very end, when the lightning strikes and all the pig slaves are electrocuted, Imagine just how wonderful the smell was in that room. (laughs) (laughs) That's disgusting. That leads to my ultimate title for this episode, which is Smoked Bacon. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That one one I'm not on board with. (laughs) Mr. Vegan over here. Oh, not a vegan. Shut up. Okay. (laughs) Anyway, that episode also gets a thumbs up. Okay. Oh, okay. All right, then. Um, I also wonder if the reason that Laszlo looks the way he does is so that it would still be believable that Tallulah would want to be with him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she know. seems to, she does genuinely seem to love him for uh, like the person he is, as opposed to his looks or what she can off, what he can offer her. Yeah. But if you like the love of your life shows up and they're like this goofy, hideous-looking pig monster, you might have second thoughts, you know. Yes. Yeah. But I guess I like that. I guess I like that she's. There's no question as to whether she's going to accept Laszlo. She's like, no, you're Laszlo. I love you. I love you. Maybe you know? she's just she's just trying to lead him to a cooker. Could be that. <laughs> <laughs> must must have smelled brilliant in there. Anyway, um, <laughs> so the Lazarus experiment. Yes, yes. Mr. Mark Gatus. It is finally in the flesh. Yes. Um, this is the worst episode of the series. Okay. Of this series, I should say. Yeah, it's not good. It's not good. Uh, it's just insubstantial. It's just kind of a, a nothing forgettable episode. Like, it's not atrocious. It's just kind of eh, forgettable, you know? Yeah. Well, it does It does feel like it feels like the function of that episode is the Doctor's finally going to meet Martha's family. That's yes. the point of that episode. Yeah. It's, it, it's yeah. about, yeah. It's, it's establishing the relationships between the Doctor and the family. Yeah, and it sets up this idea of Saxon yeah. as well. It does, it? yeah. But also I mean, just like, um, yeah. it's just like, okay, we need we need a story in which the Doctor and the family are interacting. So the story and the monster all feels very like secondary almost. Yeah, it also, it, it just, I'm not saying it's the deepest show in the world, but it sort of lacks any depth. I, I did read up a bit on it. And it said the writer was instructed to make it like a Marvel, give it Marvel Spider-Man vibes. Mm. Right, okay. And it is just that, isn't it? It's like an evil scientist that becomes a victim of his own creation and then is a monster. Like, there's nothing to it, really. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the fact that he's actually called Professor Lazarus is just unforgivable. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's not yeah, That's not allowed. You're not allowed to do that. Yeah. Um, but that is in line with Marvel writing, isn't it? You know, Victor Von Doom and characters that have names like that. That's true, I suppose, yeah. Uh, the monster is the worst CGI yet. Yep. Uh, it's oh, so worse bad. Worse than the, the nesting consciousness from the first episode? I can't even remember what... Uh, that, it's oh, what, the basically thing that just like a, that, that big pit of lava that sort of... Oh, that's bad. But I mean, like his face, Mark, the, the Professor Lazarus, that creature is dreadful. Yeah. <laughs> um, the old person makeup reminds me of Valerie and Miracle Max from The Princess Bride. You know, the people who live, <laughs> who heal Espiritu Crystal. No. He plays the old man in it's like been the forest. Too long. It's been too long since I've okay. seen Princess Bride. It's really like obvious bad old person makeup. Oh okay. yeah. Um, that's kind of all I've got to say about this one. To be honest, I I just thought it was nothing. A, a real filler episode. Oh yeah, it's definitely one of the weakest episodes. Mm. Um, yeah. I see. It's 
I see the point of like the Doctor has to meet the family, especially since they become a part of the events of the finale. Yeah. But the story, the monster and all that, it doesn't feel like, oh, this had to be the episode where we meet them. They do feel like different yeah. elements. Yeah, you know? Lazarus is literally introduced for a sentence in the finale. That sentence being... Uh, so he's explaining that the technology that Lazarus used is what he channeled into his... Oh, it goes screen. into the screwdriver. Yeah. yeah, okay, all right. Okay, so my alternate titles for this one, again, I've got, I've got two. The, the um, Lazarus shit experiment? No. Uh, hubris. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, I think this is the one I'll, I'll go with because of how it ends. Organic Matters. Okay. At the end, yeah. he plays an organ, doesn't yeah. he? Yes. Yeah. So organic <laughs> okay. matters. Uh, that one is a thumbs down. Yes. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Okay. 42. Yes. I've got similar to series two episodes, but I don't know what I mean by that. Do you mean okay. it's sim- Do you mean in terms the of the one with the devil? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's similar to that double part episode. Visually in, yeah. or story-wise? Visually, I suppose. Like a, sh- a sweaty, oily ship, you know? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, alien kind of vibes. Yeah. Uh, the time imperative of the episode, because obviously it's all a countdown this episode, basically. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the time imperative lends it an urgency that also complements its disposability, ultimately, for me. Okay. After the last one, which was just forgettable, this does feel like it crystallizes the experience of zipping through the episode to get to the next one. I didn't dislike it, mm. but it, it again felt like, all right, I'm getting through this one to get to the better stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was very Sunshine to me, the film Sunshine. Like Which came her- out before this, right? Well, it would have been the same year. Uh, I'm not sure how far apart. Okay. The idea of hurtling towards the sun, and they've even got like a pinback a facsimile, like burn with me, you know, that thing. Yes, yeah, yeah. My kind of thought of it was a sweaty crystal maze, because the, the set does look like the future zone in the crystal maze. It does. <laughs> right, yeah. okay. It's better than the Lazarus experiment, but it's still fundamentally insubstantial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think 42 is the weakest episode for me. Oh, really? Um, okay. I, re- I remember nothing of 42. Like, even having seen it recently, I remember so little about it. Okay. The Lazarus experiment, I at least remember that. Okay. I know it's, I know it's placed within the series. I know who the monster is. I know what the story's about. Okay. I, the 42, it's just kind of like, oh, there's, yeah, they're on a ship and the sun is alive. And that's all I can, I, that's all I kind of remember. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe I would that's say. That's all that, you need to know. Yeah. Maybe yeah, I'd say but this, there's one, no this one is, it, you know? Yeah. This one's bland. The Lazarus experiment is bad, I would say. Yeah. That's okay. my personal. Um, yeah, that's fair. Even if it is more memorable. Yeah. So my alternate titles for this one, Heat Slaves is the first one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Visor is another one because mm-hmm. I was Sun Visor and yeah. he got the visor. Uh-huh, yeah. But I'll probably go with, go with something that said in the episode and that was Here Comes the Sun, which is the Beatles song. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Human Nature. Yeah. Yes. Jeremy Baines is preposterous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I fucking hated him so much. <laughs> Harry Lloyd, yeah, isn't he? Went to. on to play. Yeah, he played uh, v- Viserys in Game of Thrones. Yes, um, he did. He is so cringeworthy. It, that it is the cringe of the season. His performance. Right. It's so bad. Do you agree with me on this one? <laughs> yes. Just the fucking face that he's pulling in every fucking yeah, frame. Yeah, he's he's got such a crooked mouth. Yeah. Oh, I don't know why a crooked mouth made me laugh so much. <laughs> he's got a crooked mouth. All that eaten cock. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have a glass of water. By eaten, I meant E T O N, not yeah, yeah. consumed. Um, cock, yeah, well, I should have said the last one actually, um, 42, is a thumb sideways. Okay. I, did, I forgot to say that. This one, I got, it was a thumbs down. Interesting. Personally. Okay. Yeah, I was very disheartened when it became clear it was going to be a two parter. Okay. It's like, oh no, I wanted to leave this place after this episode. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, well, I've got here, I was, I'm getting mediocrity fatigue. <laughs> so like all the episodes in a row, I was like, no, I want the good stuff. I want the good stuff back. But I think broadly speaking, if you were to ask most people, Human Nature and Family of Blood are the good stuff. I think those episodes yeah, are, they're they are very well liked in the they community. They are highly praised. I understand why, because of, you know, the whole idea of John Smith. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and that's, that stuff is well done. I'm not going to, you know, deny that. But honestly, Jeremy Baines ruined the whole thing. That is as simple as that. I can't get, I can't get over the Baines of it all. It's the Baines of my life. Or I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. The first, I, I prefer. We'll get to the second part, but the, as a single episode, thumbs down for me. Okay. My alternate titles for it. Uh, you got the Watchmaker's Son, which is the um, Watchmaker's Son. Exactly, the Watchmaker's Son. Uh, a reference to 
I think John Smith is a watchmaker's son, isn't he? And yes. that also, of course, alludes to Dr. Manhattan, who also travelled in time and space. So you've got that overlap. Okay. Um, or, as a little, like, um, blue ball in the audience, I think I would call the episode The Master, because he is an English, he is a master at the school. Oh, uh, okay. So uh, I would call the episode The Master. And, of course, it precedes... That would be, um, that'd be really a dick move on your part if you were to do It that. would. That's why I would definitely I do it. I fully respect that. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think it. It, it wouldn't be it'd be a it would be a major dick move if you didn't get the master order the fact he comes in a few episodes i feel like you can get away with it yeah, yeah okay all right but okay the family of blood yes. yes harry lloyd was really really pissing me off i don't know if i made that clear <laughs> but i just bit, couldn't yeah, yeah. get i yeah. just can't get over him um i like that they dedicated time to him having to sacrifice his humanity i like that it's, it wasn't an easy decision just because we know he's the doctor, you know? It's a yeah, realistic yeah. reaction. It's like, as far as he's concerned, he's just this guy. Yeah, yes. And I like that it was operating within the reality of the show of, no, this should be a really hard decision. <laughs> like, you wouldn't just make this easily, you know? Yeah, yeah. I like the fates to which the villains are ultimately consigned, that they do live forever, but in, you know, abject misery. Yeah. Yes. Um, I like that. Well, okay, the ending of the episode, you know, the World War One portion mm-hmm. is great. Yeah. But my reaction to that yeah. was, well, where, where was that for the rest of the fucking episode? Where the fuck did that come from? That's a great moment. Right. But I needed that throughout, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so my alternate titles for this episode, I've got three. The first one is Straw Man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the one that I probably go with is Goodbye, Mr. Smith. Because uh, I don't know if either of you are familiar with a film called Goodbye, Mr. Chips, which is about an English school teacher. Yeah. So mm-hmm. Goodbye, Mr. Smith. Uh, or, if ever it was appropriate, Doctor Who? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If ever it was appropriate, it's this episode. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Part of it is, is, is inspired by optimism, but uh, thumbs up to this episode. Okay. I will okay. say, I do yeah. like the Scarecrow. Yeah, the, yeah. The scarecrow. I like the Scarecrow. I do yeah. like that. They're, yeah. good, they're good villains. And I also like the um, that little sequence when he's on the Family of Bloods ship and he's pretending to still be John Smith. Yes. And he's like fumbling around and doing all the switches. That's a nice little mm-hmm. moment. Because it also kind of inadvertently, I don't know if it's deliberate, but it sort of inadvertently shows how the Doctor perceives John Smith. You know? Yes. So it's sort of a nice little insight. Yeah, there. for where it ends up, it's really good. But I just needed a bit more of that before the fact, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Blink. Yes. Big one. Well, it's obviously the best episode, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. I mean, I don't know if that it will always be the best episode, but it's certainly the best of the series and the best thus far. Yes. yes. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah, it's. I've got nothing bad to say about Blink. It's a perfect little sci-fi construct. It reminded me of The Constant, the lost episode. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. This predates it, but, you know, just in terms of the themes and the cleverness of the writing. Yeah. So it gets some complicated, plotty stuff done very quickly and very efficiently. In terms of her friend goes back in time. Like, all that stuff is done really quickly and you, you're with it every step of the way. Yeah. And then the video and, you know, it's all really well done. The Weeping Angels are fairly creepy. I'll grant it that. Like, yes. even now, yep. they're pretty creepy. I like that the... Uh, so Kerry Mulligan is basically the star of this episode. She's really good. Yes. I'm a big fan yeah. of her anyway. I, I like that the, that detective definitely helps her because she's fit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Like, you see that before he even asks her out. Yeah, you know, yeah. He just looks at her, he goes, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll help you. Um, oh, you would, you know? Yeah, you would, you would, yeah. Uh, I love this concept that the angels feed off abstract energy. I think that's great. The idea that Mm -hmm. they are sated by what you could have been had you continued. I think that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a very time travel-y episode. I know that sounds stupid in the context of Doctor Who, but you know what I mean, right? It's it's playing with like the actual mechanics and physics of time travel. And yes, um, yes, it's like that's at the forefront rather than just going to a place that's of another time. Yeah. Mm. It's a great threat as well. Just like playing with that impossibility of blinking, you know, like that is a great, Anxiety. Yes. Yeah. Because you can just imagine it. Like when you're just playing stare offs with your mates, it's impossible. Yes. Um, all of the payoffs in this episode are just brilliant. All the, the wrap ups and the payoffs, like mm-hmm. the four of them looking at each other because he tricks them into surrounding the TARDIS. And then that's just fucking writing one. That's brilliant. That's yeah. really yeah. good. Um, though I got to say, it's fucking lucky there are four of them. <laughs> <laughs> that's my only. Yeah. That's my only little caveat to that. But, you know, I, I forgive it, that little detail. Yeah. I love that the Doctor does everything from a distance in this episode. He's, like, not really in it. Yeah. yeah. You know? I love that. I love the ending. The ending is almost non-diegetic. 
because it ends with the montage of just statues in yeah. the real world. Yes. That's not the show, as in, like, that's not happening in the world of the show. That is just the showrunners, the showmakers, kind of inculcating a fear of statues within the young. Yeah. That's just like, oh, yeah. Well, you've seen this now. Look, they're everywhere. Look, they're gargoyles. <laughs> they're fucking, you know, they're all around you. I love that. Um, and this is the one episode where I've said there is no need for an alternative title. Blink covers it pretty well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thumbs up all the way. Yeah. Yes. All the way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, this is definitely Moffat firing on all the cylinders. And you yeah. can see how, when it was announced that he was going to take over from Russell T. Davis, when he's got episodes like Blink under his belt, yeah. everyone was like, over the moon. It was like, oh, he's absolutely the right guy. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I, I will say my little, it's not, it's not like a criticism, but it's like a little anecdote, if anything. When when I met um, David Tennant, I, he, he asked what my favourite episode was, and I told him this, and his response was, you mean the one I'm not really in? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know whether I insulted him or, or, or not. He must have but known. Yeah, that like, was his when he was reading that script for the first time, he must have known, like, oh, shit, this is going to be the best episode of Doctor Who I ever do. I'm not even yes. in it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just everything Everything works. Like, you know, the, the detective going back and then being an old man in the hospital and... Uh, how they, they like put all the footage together, and mm. he he knows what she's gonna say. It it's all really clever stuff. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Like in Iceland, it's just what it's probably one of the best written episodes of anything. Yeah, because you know, like it, it's it, you're with it, and it's really good writing. But then at the end, when everything starts paying off, it's just hit, hit after hit of like, oh shit. Fuck, yeah. this is good. You know. Yeah. Um. Yes. No. Highly. I don't know. I feel bad. High like, praise. It's a good episode and it deserves to be praised and it's, you know, but what else can we say? About it's it? harder to say much when your thoughts are entirely good, you know? Yeah. The only thing you can follow it up with is go watch it. Yeah, go watch it. Like, even if, um, like, this does work entirely in isolation. Yeah, if you've never seen an episode of Doctor Who before, you don't need to. Absolutely. To watch this. Yeah, no, watch it. It's good. Though the problem with that is it is the best episode or one of the best episodes. So if you start with this, it's all Yeah, that's true. Here, that's true. Know? I I mean I don't I don't think there's going to be a better episode personally. We'll I see. doubt it. I doubt you can top blink for me cuz not only is it clever and everything, it's clever with the idea of time travel, you know. So but yeah, we'll see. We will yeah, see. Yeah, we'll see. Um okay, Utopia. Yes. Yeah. Um I, I I really I don't like Captain Jack. I don't know if I've said that before. <laughs> you <laughs> have, yes. I just don't get it. I don't get his thing. I know he's gay or he's bi or whatever the fuck he is. I, I just he's I everything. Like I think he's a, yeah he's everything. He's he's both sexual. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know they they go to like well the end of time, don't they? They go to trillions of years in the future. Yep. Yeah, I know it's another planet, but it's not different enough. I don't know where you start in, in conceiving trillions of years in the future when basically everything has ended like all life has been yeah. eradicated there's no am I right in saying there's like no stars in the sky like deliberately yeah there's like, like all nothing stars yeah. like an option paralysis is definitely a risk when you're trying to construct this sort of idea mm. but if there was ever an opportunity to do something like psychedelic like unthinkable that now would be the time you okay. know like trillions of years in the future on another planet is not going to be Mad Max with 21st century guns yeah. yeah it needed to really go like far out there yeah um so considering that it's the end of the universe, it's the return of Captain Jack and the reveal of the master, mm -hmm. it feels a little bit like filler. But I didn't know at the time that it was the first part of a three-parter. Okay, so yeah. At the time, though, yeah. Um, the music's a bit cringe when it's revealed that he is the I mean, I, the really, master. I really, really love Murray Gold's music. I think Doctor Who, is, it just hasn't been the same without him because he did series one through to series 10. Yeah. And you'll okay. notice as you go along, like as the show changes and as the presentation of the show changes, so does his music. He he kind of evolves with the show. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, sort of revisiting older episodes, it is a bit like, you know, it can be a bit childish and plinky plonky and just kind of like, you know, Murray Gold wasn't at his peak when he began. He sort of grew into it. Yeah. I mean, it's meant to be this epic moment, isn't it, when it's revealed that it, he's the master. Yeah. Yeah. And I just felt the, the music was a, too much, a bit over, okay. you know? That's really all I've got to say about this one. Oh, okay. Yeah. My alternate titles are The Professor, okay, Yana, or my favourite one, You're Not Gonna Believe This. And I, I think I have to <laughs> submit submit the last one as my official right. uh, title. You're Not Gonna Believe This. You're Not Gonna Believe This. <laughs> 
what about, what about you gents what, what are your thoughts on utopia well again utopia is held in very high regard i don't know how much of that is okay. the reveal like just the reveal yeah and yeah. how much of it is the episode itself yeah i like i do like utopia it's not bad it just um it didn't feel like much to me you know okay yeah i'm not, I'm not a big i'm not a big fan of Derek jacoby too so okay. okay see i would say yeah i don't mind captain jack Chando really gets on my tits. <laughs> well, she dies, so yes, that's all good. Yeah, thank God. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, she, she really winds me up. But I do kind of like the whole Yana, you're, you are not alone kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I can't, on that front, I can't really complain. I think it is, when it came out, I knew it was like the first part of three. Yes, yeah. So I think it was, oh, okay, this is the setup. And then we'll see where it goes. Yeah, fair. Yeah. Uh, well, I didn't know that. So that kind of did inform my opinion a little bit. Thinking of it more as a three-parter, it, it, it does go up in my estimation. Mm-hmm. But yeah, broadly, thumb sideways to Utopia. Okay. okay. Well, it's obviously a necessity if you're going to watch the three-parter. But yeah, it's an individual yeah, episode. That's fine. Um, I don't know about you guys, but like, it, when I first saw Mantis in the MCU from like Guardians of the Galaxy 2, Chan Tho, whatever she's called... She's. I immediately thought of her. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, yeah. They feel very similar. I don't, I don't mind Mantis though. No, well, yeah, you know, on on that level. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. Come on, now, lads. Come on. Um, okay. The sound of drums. Yep. Yes. I like John Sim. I like John Sim a lot. Yep. I've yeah. always liked John Sim. I think he's good as the master. There's nothing special about the performance of his villainy. Like it's pretty cookie cutter. I'm a bit mad and charismatic, and you know. Yeah. But I, it's fine, you know. I liked it, even even if it's not distinct, you know. But he does it really well. Yeah. Sometimes that's all you need. Like you know, yeah. it's nice yeah. to have a completely idiosyncratic performance, mm-hmm. but just having like a guy who like really fills a stereotype or like a typical role well. Yeah. Sometimes that can be enough. Oh, yeah. he's eminently watchable. Like he fills the room. You yes. know, He's really inhabiting that role. Mm. Little Anne Widdicombe cameo, which I thought was a bit odd. Oh, yeah. Is it, nah, it's funny, <laughs> I assume though, that Russell T. Davis's politics and hers are diametrically opposed. Uh, so I thought that was an interesting little overlap. Okay. It, it's all, I've just got here all coming together nicely. Yeah. To me, like all the stuff from the series is paying off, you know? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And when the American president show, showed up, it's like, oh, that's the guy that plays the American in every British show. I don't know what his name is. But I've seen, I think he's in my family. He's always in like BBC shows as an American. Yes, right. he is. Um, so he obviously lives over here, you know. Mm. Again, because this is, this is a two, a three-parter, it's hard to think of it much in isolation. So that's kind of all I've really got to say about that one. Okay. It's sort of a John, John Sim showcase episode. It's my, of, of the three episodes, The Sound of Drums is my favourite. I think I agree. Yeah, I really yeah. like that episode. Uh, but that's kind of all I've got to say about it, really. My... Uh, alt- alternative title for that episode is <clears throat> Anglo-Saxon. Come on. Right. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that is a thumbs up. Yes. So the thumbs c- up can I just quickly Sam point out the a, uh, American president is actually Canadian in real life. Oh, is he? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. But, but yeah, he has, he does seem to have a habit of playing Americans. Yes. Okay. Series finale. Yep. Last of the Time Lords. Yes. Okay, so the homunculus doctor. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I like the idea of it, uh, but like Dobby, whose ears have just been castrated. <laughs> yeah. not, not so much. <laughs> but he's got such big sad eyes. <laughs> he's got big sad eyes. It's the thinking that like what John Sims' master has done, because the doctor's like 900 odd years old at this point in time. Yeah. So he sort of like aged the doctor to be 900 years old. Is that what the thinking is? Well, he just aged him, hasn't he? So he's just it, aged it, him. In the, he ages him to 900, but then when they have their little plan and they try and attack the master, yeah. he takes then all the help that the regeneration is supposed to give him out of it as well. Right, okay, I see. So this is what he would look like as a result if of that. If he never regenerated. Yeah. Without moisturising. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. It reminded me, I, I don't think either of you have seen either show, but it, the episode reminded me a little bit of um, Fringe and Battlestar Galactica, especially like, because it jumps ahead a year, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. And this idea that thing, like everything has changed under Saxon's rule, you know, like all these people have died and that's a very, like Fringe did this alternate parallel universe thing and Battlestar Galactica 
jumps ahead and all the characters are in prison at one point and mm. it felt a bit like that and I liked that I liked that it was sort of like an, a military episode yeah you know yes yeah um, I quite like that the Doctor is sidelined for most of the finale. I do quite like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that Martha is the agent yes. responsible for much of the action. Yeah, so Goya, Jack is the face of Bo. Whatever. I have no feelings either way about it. Just in the sense of, I don't know whether I'm supposed... Well, I'm obviously supposed to go, oh my God! Um, it doesn't annoy me, but it doesn't evince that response either. It's just a, yeah, whatever. Um, it's just a detail. You yeah, know? I wonder why they did that. I don't know whether it was just the kind of neatly like, oh, that's one more thing that we can sort of tie up sort of the origin yeah. of the face of Bo without actually having to do, like, dedicate time to, like, explaining who he is. I and can't whatnot. remember the exact, but I know Russell T. Davis wasn't going to do it. And then they were like, no, you need to stop denying that they're supposed to be the same person now. So he did it basically because he was. Yeah, I did read up on like, that. Like, this oh, okay. is stop, like, dicking around halfway or something. Like, commit. Yeah. Like, either do it or don't sort of thing, so he did it. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, again, not not much to say. Broadly positive. Yeah. I like that the Master ends up being the main villain of Series 3. I think that's really good. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, thumbs up. Thumbs up to Last of the Time mm-hmm. Lords. Okay. Uh, but alternate titles, it doesn't, again, this doesn't really need one, but I've, I have I've nevertheless have three alternatives. Okay. The first one is War Drums, pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then I thought, oh, wouldn't it be clever? Because John Sim is famous for being in Life on Mars, which is, of course, named after a David Bowie song. Yes. So what if I called the episode, also named this episode after a David Bowie song. So the two that seemed most befitting were Starman or Rebel Rebel. And I think I would probably go with Rebel Rebel. Okay, I like it. So that means season three is a big thumbs up. Yay! Yay! <laughs> yeah, I liked it. Yeah. I really liked it. It's, it's a massive improvement over Series 2. It is. Yes. I'm enjoying the show now. Is it an improvement over Series 1? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, was yeah, I liked Series 1 a lot. Um, well, I, I liked I liked it. I liked Eccleston as the Doctor. Mm-hmm. But in terms of the quality of the writing of the episodes, yeah, it's shot through the roof. Yeah. yeah. Like, ju- just blink, yeah. you know? You could submit that as that Series 3. Like, all right. It wins. Okay. Yes. But I yeah, say, yeah. There's I plenty think of good stuff. This is my favourite series as a whole. So Yeah, again, I I'm not confident that something's gonna beat it. <laughs> okay, so let's just I feel at the end of each series review I should recap on who my favourite Doctor Companion episode and series mm-hmm. are thus far. Okay. Okay. So the way things currently stand, my favourite Doctor remains Christopher Eccleston. Mm-hmm. My favourite companion is Martha. Yep. Uh, my fa- I, th- I think she's going to be hard to beat as well to be honest Boo. my favourite um, series is series 3 my favourite episode is Blink okay that's fair. apart from Martha we're all uh, yeah you're, 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 you're pretty on the nose <laughs> I'm doing alright am I okay yeah. oh shut up George <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I d- yeah I don't know what the problem with Martha is it might just be black 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 you're black, racist black, 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 black. <laughs> completely racist <laughs> No, it's not that. It's, I mean, um, give me a better excuse then, George. I'm trying to think of one, Eddie. It's because um, you don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's think. I like the idea of her as a companion. It, there are instances where it feels too much like it's like... Black! No. <laughs> it's because she's black, <laughs> George. It's fine. If I can accept the, the, you know, the role of the misogynist on the series, you can accept the role of the racist. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's it's, it's a role Doctor that I should who, take. It's Doctor Who, uh, not Doctor Black. <laughs> <laughs> oh fucking yeah. hell yeah I don't know what it is I don't know if it's the performance but then again she's not doing a bad job you know mm. and I like that Martha's um, like she sort of leaves on her own terms yes is she done now it, would it be a spoiler to say not really because no. I mean I get, I would know if I was in the real world like okay. they released this news yeah, no yeah uh, so she she is the companion for series no. 4 then. no she's not oh she's not so she is done she She's done she as a companion. Yeah. yeah. Right, okay. She, she might feature okay, in an she, episode, but yeah, she's uh, done as the companion. You've got Catherine Tate oh, right, okay. to look forward to. I her. thought she was in it for another no. series. Nope. Oh, that is... I'm bitterly disappointed. <laughs> okay, this this does crystallize series three and it is completely in its own snow globe then. Yeah, I think this it's not going to get better than this, unfortunately, for me. Right. <laughs> but, okay. we'll, but we'll see. So Catherine Tate is next, is she? Yeah. Fuck! <laughs> Well, on that fucking miserable note, shall we wrap up? Yes, it seems about right. <laughs> okay. One final note, though. You are. I was going to say one final note about series three. Um, 
the series three finale was the first time the Doctor Who felt epic. Okay. Me. Just the scope of what they were doing. Like even even when they were like in like John Sim has gone to like this like little neighborhood street and mm. he's trying to find Martha and all that sort of stuff. Like it felt properly even when I saw it for the first time, it felt like really Yeah, interesting. Uh, epic, epic is not the word I would use, but I guess that's what I mean by comparing it to Fringe and Battlestar Galactica. There's something about a TV show that jumps time. Again, I know Doctor Who does it a lot. It displays a confidence in the storytelling, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely, like I said, it, at the end of Gridlock, it made it feel like, oh, that was a moment of poetry. This is starting to feel like a TV show. Yeah, the the, the events that unfold in that three-part finale, it definitely make, made it feel more like a drama, you know? Mm, yeah. Uh, something worth your time anyway, um, even if principally for children right so on that note uh we bid you no no you can't we, do that we bid you you can't freaking do that we bid you adieu uh, uh see you on you bastard the next episode where we'll be discussing series four <laughs> yes we will thank you bye bye everyone bye bye